Center Voice, Voices, Twitter, uh, we've been all over the place. So I'm, we're glad that uh, we've been able to get out the word and certainly with the help, help of the Mountain News. Uh, so just to do a couple of quick introductions, first and foremost, we wanna thank our community members for joining us, but also I did see here briefly our MPP for Hamilton Mountain, Monique Taylor. Monique, welcome. Um, and also, I did receive regrets from Councillor Scott Duval uh, for Central Mountain. He wishes that he could be here, um, but uh, unfortunately he had a prior commitment, so he does send his uh, best wishes to uh, this evening. And last but not least, I believe I also saw Councillor uh, Brian McCaddy here for a moment, although he may be outside. Um, so welcome to everyone that are, that are joining us. What I do ask is for those that are making presentations this evening, as you see your name coming on the list, please come down to the front and just wait along the wall perhaps so that way we can quickly uh, get the next speaker to the microphone. Um, we will call one person at a time. Each delegation has a, uh, either a five or 10 minute delegation depending on 
the time that you've requested. And uh, I will warn you when you have one minute remaining, uh, just to let you know that uh, you need to wrap up shortly, and then when you're at time, I'll indicate that as well. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to call the first speaker on the list, and that is E and R Co. Welcome, and I think the mic is on. If you want to point it towards you, let's just make sure that's working. Okay. Uh, good evening, trustees. My name is Emily Coe, and this is my husband, Ryan. We are here tonight in support of the Central Mountain Accommodation Review Committee's recommendation number one. Our oldest son currently attends junior kindergarten at Linden Park. We have another son who will enroll in junior kindergarten in 2016. Having attended Linden Park myself some 30 years ago, I have wonderful memories and lasting impressions from my teachers and experiences there, and I had hoped the same for my children. However, I recognize that nostalgia is not a reason to keep a school open. I could also stand here and talk about how research has proven that smaller schools are more beneficial to students, about the advantages of walkability within a neighborhood, and perhaps about how the ARC's recommendation number one meets the imposed reference criteria. Between my husband and I, we have attended nearly every single ARC meeting, both working and public, and have become quite knowledgeable with this process. But truth be told, I would rather speak to you from the heart in support of our school rather than quote facts and statistics to you. We purchased our house in 2007, returning to the neighborhood that I grew up in and that we wanted to raise our children in. One of the reasons that we relocated where we did was due to the proximity to both Linden Park Elementary School and Hill Park High School, and the fact that we would be able to walk our children to school. Also, the property on which these schools are located is in the heart of our neighborhood, adjacent to the Hill Park Recreation Center, the Sackville Hill Senior Center, tennis courts, and abundant green space. All places that benefit the surrounding community have links to Linden Park, and that we and others enjoy as a family. With the imminent closure of Hill Park next month, the proposed shuttering of Linden Park just one year later will leave a gaping hole in the middle of our neighborhood. The wonderful partnership between Linden Park and Hill Park has already been broken and there will be further damage to these links that Linden Park has within our community that will result from shutting its doors. Having become involved on the parent council and through attending school events, it is evident how close-knit the staff, students and families of Linden Park are. It may be a small school, but our school has a big heart. Although our son can be described as a social butterfly already at the age of five, because of the size of our school, he knows many of the other older children by name, as well as most of the other teachers on staff. And since he began junior kindergarten back in September, we have seen tremendous growth in his knowledge and development, obviously a direct result of the fantastic staff and supportive caring environment of Linden Park. The board staff's and ARC recommendation number two also proposes to divide Linden Park's population between two different schools, thus again severing the ties established within Linden Park itself. Our son has flourished and thrived in the eight short months since he began school and we want to keep this momentum going. There are children who adapt and cope well with change and we acknowledge that our son is likely one of these children, but many children do not. To not only close a school, but to split up friends and classmates may turn routines and lives upside down. There is no chance for a solid foundation of confidence and well-being to be built by doing so. I also want to speak about the today's family daycare located within Linden Park. Our oldest son is enrolled in this daycare. Our younger son is enrolled at another today's family daycare within the city. From the age of one, our oldest son attended the same today's family daycare that his brother currently attends up until last summer at which point we transferred him over to the Linden Park location in preparation for the beginning of junior kindergarten in the fall. This is another example of a fantastic partnership and tie to the community that Linden Park has. We were thrilled to have our son enrolled to attend junior kindergarten and still be able to maintain our relationship with today's family all in the same place. The daycare has also provided for a seamless day as he is within the same building and he is with many other children who attend school with him. One minute. No one wants to have their neighborhood school closed, and in the end, not everyone will be happy with the decisions that are made. 
We ask that you strongly consider ARC recommendation number one and the impacts that the other ARC and board staff recommendations will have on our community. I also want to note that when the board staff report was presented on March 24th, it was indicated to you that the staff recommendation was the only option that pays for itself, which was unfair and disadvantageous to state. I urge you to not let this be the driving reason behind your decision. Please contemplate all that I have said tonight, as well as the strong support shown for Linden Park throughout the ARC process. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Before we go to the next delegation, I just want to mention that at the end of the presentation, trustees do have an opportunity uh, up to five minutes for questions to the delegates. So those are questions for clarification. So it may not happen for every delegation, but however, if a trustee does have a question, I may be calling the delegate back to the podium. Uh, so we, and also one further note, we do have uh, Trustee Petal who is in transit and she's on her way. And also we, we re have regrets from student trustee Susick. Uh, so the next delegate is S. Wary Blansky. Sorry, I'm really nervous, so if I start oh, staring, there you are. yeah, I'm ready. If I start stammering, I'm sorry. And if sorry, I'm not. Before, before you begin, you can calm your nerves. Trustee West has a question. Trustee uh, West Hicks. Are we uh, going to vote to uh, send these all back as one uh, after the presentation, which we've done? Up yeah, to and this if that, time? I believe that's the preference of trustees. I see nods. So, following all the presentations, we'll receive them at once with a motion. And any questions in particular that would like to be referred back to staff that we hear from a delegation can be done so following the delegation. Thank you, Trustee Hicks. And to our delegates, you may begin. Okay, um, hello, my name is Sarah. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. And I'm sure some people here may recognize me from meetings, from rants on social media, and possibly angry emails you have found in your inboxes. But for the most part, I'm a mother of two, and, oh, here we go. My son attends Linden Park. My daughter is at Cardinal Heights, and both are slated to close. I knew Linden was a goner as soon as they heard the, that it was on the roster, it was likely. There have been rumors for years that Linden Park was closing. I kind of got used to it, and it was only a matter of time before it was gonna happen, but I'm still kind of upset if it's going to. I tried to enroll my daughter into Queensdale when me and my husband bought our home seven years ago, but we were declined due to the boundary issues. I tried to enroll both my children into Armstrong this past September so they'd both be together in the same school and was told there was possibly no room. So this now irritates me that my two kids weren't accepted due to possible space and boundaries, but we are now gonna be moving hundreds of kids into these same locations. The fact that we are closing schools in less than a year from start to end is kind of upsetting. We are doing it with what I think is actual little dialogue happening between the parents, the staff, and the board, and the government who's kind of nowhere to be seen in all of this, and all you get from them is a generic email with a pre-written response that's probably been sent to everybody. Sometimes the process seemed as if it came out off as like a maneuver. It's gave people a chance to vent, and to kind of be in the process, it kind of looked like these weren't forced decisions, and that the end result was ultimately gonna be made by our peers, the art committee, based on info provided by us. So my problem is the method and the data, the cost and the time frame. The premise of the question itself was kind of a loaded question. It almost came off as, do you support the decision to close underutilized schools so that we can have money to put back into your child's education? In my opinion, that's why I don't think too many people got involved, because that sounded like a great thing, and it is, but at the same time, I don't think the process that we're going through is necessarily the best. So I'm kind of concerned as well as why we didn't hear anything from the government or the board or anyone else who might have had also the same stance of we want to do these things, but we don't have the money for them, and to, by closing your schools, we can get it. So that's kind of been an issue in myself that I haven't able, been able to get answers from the government as, as well about. Now, when I make a decision in my life, I try to use reasoning and logic and factual information when I make decisions. I'm not a fan of decisions based on random statistical data as well. It has a lot of fallacies, specifically when the person providing the data is the same person who decides the outcome based on it. It's pretty much stacking the deck. Plus, the statistical data based on the past is not really an effective means of decisions made for the future. One size does not always fit all. And again, the fact that the person providing the information can actually out control the outcome. People may think they're making decisions, but because they've only been given the choices they can make based on the information they've been provided by the same person, they're pretty much not in control because someone else is always controlling the wheel and can steer it in the direction they want. So that's kind of bugged me. 
and also the fact that closures are on pretty much predicted numbers. We hear that in 10 years, the population will be something, and it's kind of based on a vague generalization of the past growth trends. My question is, how do we know, and what is the confidence you guys have in these numbers? What influential variables have you factored into the method to get these results? Is it just solely based on the past? And again, how do we know there's, the numbers are not going to be incorrect and we're gonna be in trouble? When I question about these during the ARC meetings and when these numbers were challenged, all that would happen, it seemed like arguments would break out. Never did anyone say, well, let's see what numbers you have or info and we can differentiate and see whether we have made some errors and there may be some things that are incorrect. We were just told the numbers are always correct and that's made people upset. So just in regards to the declining enrollment and the possibility that it's never gonna be, I guess, going up as much as it has in the past, people just wanna know what factual proof can we be shown? On Central Mountain, there are about eight to 10,000 homes within the next 10,000, uh, 10, 10 years that will be up for sale. And that's a large turnover rate for one specific area. Now those homes for the most part will probably be bought by younger families and children who will require a school. Also with the proposed sale of the land from Hill Park and most likely Linden if it's shut, we can almost assume it will be sold to developers and those children as well will need desks. So we'd like to know if you have factored in those children and if someone has sat with the developer and if that does go through, if those will be homes and will we have room for those children. Also, because we're using numbers that are showing every five years or so the birth rate has dropped, the numbers are actually starting to stay the same or they're rising from what I've observed. Not only that, but the data that you guys have used is probably based on trends from the past, not factoring in that the immigration rate has changed, the ethnicity of the people ending our city are also different as well. Today we have many different nationalities joining our communities and they have larger families and house anywhere from th six, three to six kids alone. Now, I just wanna know if we factored in any of the rates regarding immigration, the new home developments, land that you guys still own that might sell to developers and the turnover rate that's gonna be happening for Central Mountain. Also with the lack of actual careers available in society today, it's not like we're before, people were going to college and working for 10 years before having kids and we've seen a large drop in the population rate from that generation. Most people are also are only working just a job and they don't care if they leave for maternity or have kids before they go to college. So we kind of need to re-examine what we used in our trends to um, predict the number of population growth. According to the ARC in 2012, the utilization for Linden Park was 47%. And I am sure the number of students the government is aiming to have occupy one classroom, what is considered being utilized well. Having less kids in the class should have actually been given us optimal ability. We should have a high success rate and the grades should be quite high. So if we are that underutilized, why aren't the grades really high? When we get into younger grades, children require more face-to-face -face time, not just put in front of a book and left to do it themselves. They need one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. There's actually an abundance of science behind this, not just blind statistics, but proven facts that have been tested theories. Scientists, psychologists, and others have already shown that children require more time with teachers, more interaction, not only for their intellectual growth, but emotional as well. I'm not familiar with the government or their school's ideology about the emotional intelligence of children, but if you read a book on psychology, you will see what a good is an intelligent mind if it has no intelligence, to, emotional intelligence to back it. When kids have too little human interaction, they develop poor people skills, no understanding on how to express themselves properly and so on. You can make the smartest kids in the world, but if they can't relay the message properly, have poor people skills and are unable to interact with others, the odds of them being successful are slim. Throwing a bunch of kids into a room and spending no one-on-one -on -one time with them is not going to help, let alone be a waste of time and money. Studies out of Sweden currently prove that kids who learned in smaller classes had, quote, higher cognitive and non-cognitive skills than their peers, and they also scored better on standardized national tests. Teachers are also asking today for even small class sizes because of the lack of funds we have for EAs and helpers. To accommodate classes with special needs students, we will need smaller groups of children in each class. This is, a modest, this is a modest request many parents will probably agree with even if their child isn't classified as having a special needs. The amount of teacher to student time alone is not enough today, let alone when we are losing funding for the help and we are gonna start stacking kids into rooms at 30 plus. If we are closing vocational schools dedicated to special needs, the teachers will need more time on top of this to spend with those students, not only to help them, but to monitor who may be falling behind. Maybe the underutilization is something both teachers and parents want. The government seems to not want to spend the extra money, but at the same time, these children need to learn and they need the teachers there to help. Even if we were to move to e-learning and cooperative learning, we need teachers to make sure our children are doing things properly and help out those who may need it. Kids should not be teaching other kids all the time. And if they don't know what they are talking about, then we're gonna be in a whole another problem. 
Linden Park is underutilized as well, is because we have not included full day kindergarten because we have nowhere to put these children. So I would like to know how we were factored with that. If we would have had those kids, we would have made it. But because we don't have the classroom for them that fits the typical requiring a bathroom and their whatever the else, we've had that disadvantage. So we've been disadvantaged with the number of children on the ground because we don't have as many kindergarten students. And our kindergarten students we do have are only classified as half a child. So two of our kindergartens make one child. Had the school implemented the full day daycare, we may not have been here. And why since 2010, when it was announced we were gonna be doing full day day kindergarten, was Linden Park never upgraded. Instead, we were neglected and now it's a reason to close our school. Again, myself and the others who live in that neighborhood are questioning why this is happening and how do we know that the, we're not gonna have a growth rate? Because Ward 7, according to the city in 2006, had more children aged zero to 14 than anywhere else in the city. The city's data on population projection is showing a continued rate of growth for our area. It will undoubtedly include children. We also have the most homes that contain families that have children. One minute. Um, also, um, with the new schools, they seem to be going into newer developments. Um, this kind of confuses me as to why we would put them there and spend the money when in 20 years from now, those homes will all probably have no children in them as well and we will just end up sending kids from the rest of the city to those schools. So, Confucius, the Chinese philosopher once said, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. I'd just like to ask the board, if we wanna make changes in our schools, we need to focus on helping our children develop the schools, that, the skills that will make them successful. We need to build intellects and thinkers, movers and shakers. We need to make the dreamers doers. We need more than just the technological upgrades, that's a start, but we need more hands-on. So I'm asking on behalf of Hamiltonians in the Central Mountain that all these meetings and closures be stopped until after the June 12th election, and that we ask the city councilors, the trustees, and our board to help and recommend changes to the funding formula for the public education system to the next sitting provincial government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next delegate is Councillor Brian McCaddy. Welcome. Thanks very much. Well, I've had the uh, opportunity to attend uh, three of these sessions over the last uh, week or so, a bit more than a week, uh, with the Flamborough ARC uh, process uh, last week, and uh, East Hamilton uh, last night, and, and Central Mountain tonight. And in Ward 1, uh, about a year and a bit ago, we went through our own uh, ARC process involving George R. Allen and Prince Philip School, a much smaller ARC than yours, uh, a much uh, simpler, I guess, in that sense, but the decision was to close Prince Philip School uh, the last school on the south side of Main Street. Uh, so that was a difficult uh, experience for the, uh, the parents and the, and the students in that area uh, as well. So these are awful, difficult processes, the ARC uh, processes that uh, we've been through uh, as, a, as a community, as a, as a city, uh, all throughout Hamilton. And I know it's difficult for the, uh, the, the board members as well as, they, uh, as the trustees who uh, have to make these uh, final decisions. But I do have hope that uh, the trustees are listening, having attended three meetings uh, and looking around the, uh, the horseshoe. Uh, you do see uh, folks listening, and I'm hopeful that uh, there will be a strong consideration of a number of the uh, recommendations and thoughts from the parents uh, in all three of the ARC uh, uh, processes that uh, have been going on. I wanted to, uh, and I should mention as well, in addition to uh, being a, the Ward 1 Councillor representing the West End, uh, I also sit on the, uh, the Joint uh, uh, City Council School Board Trustee uh, Liaison Committee. Uh, and uh, we're actually meeting this Thursday, a couple days from now. And uh, I think many of the issues we're, uh, we're talking about this last week or so and, and we hear about uh, should be on the agenda, will be on the agenda this, uh, this Thursday as we continue to find ways for uh, City Council, who uh, work on all sorts of different issues uh, across the city and the neighborhoods, uh, and the school board trustees who are, are charged with uh, working on the, on the school uh, system. We, uh, we have a lot in common and we need to continue to bring, uh, build much stronger bonds uh, between City Council and, uh, and the school board. There are uh, three things I, I wanted to touch on and I uh, asked the, the trustees to, to allow me to, to, to uh, speak to them again. I think you've, you've probably heard much of this last night, but 
Uh, it's important that I think we, uh, we find a way to slow down in this process. Uh, it's uh, just from a city council perspective, uh, we're faced with a situation where we may need to find the funds, taxpayers' dollars, to acquire a whole series of, of uh, vacant school properties uh, should all the different uh, closures occur as a result of these three arcs. And that's a very difficult thing to do, to find that uh, money in the, in the schools, uh, cap or the uh, city council rather, our uh, capital budget, which only has so much money set aside for land purchases. So if we're faced with that situation, we, we may not be able to make the best decisions ourselves. And we, and we don't want to be put in that situation. We want to be able to, to protect as, as much land as possible. I think as the last speaker said, uh, while things may be uh, uh, a certain way today in terms of enrollment, uh, things do change in these neighborhoods. And uh, I've heard from our planning department that uh, the East Hamilton area, for as an example, is starting to grow. Uh, so we need to have the uh, options available in the future, ideally for schools to go back into some of these neighborhoods if they, if they have disappeared at one point in time. The land needs to be there in order to, to have that flexibility to, uh, to make that decision. The other uh, thing I spoke about last night, it, it may not be as applicable in this case, but uh, uh, making uh, facility partnership agreements where, where the actual school, uh, in terms of the pupils, may be only 60, 70 percent, whatever the number might be, full of, uh, of pupils, uh, but there are, is space in that school that can be used by other partners in the neighborhood or in the community. And uh, the example that was brought to me was uh, Central uh, School behind us here behind City Hall where the, the second floor, as I understand it, uh, was used by an insurance company for a, a number of years uh, before the enrollment uh, rebounded in that, uh, in that neighborhood, in those neighborhoods, and uh, it's now full of students. Uh, and there may be other opportunities. Uh, uh, I don't know as much about the mountain schools as I do about East Hamilton and uh, elsewhere, but it may be opportunities uh, in this case as well. As, as a possibility. The last thing I wanted to talk about, and it's been touched on, and I, I touched on in terms of the liaison committee, I think it's imperative that City Council and the, the school board trustees stand shoulder by shoulder and, and go to the province of Ontario and say, look, we need you to change your rules. Uh, because the, uh, the trustees uh, are put in the very difficult position uh, with the Ministry of Education's uh, guidance and, and the, the rules that they have to follow. Uh, which really ends up putting us locally in a very, and I'll, I'll, I don't know if it's too strong a word, uh, obscene uh, situation where uh, schools and, and different parts of neighborhoods are pitted against each other uh, and uh, we have to have those very, very difficult uh, uh, discussions and uh, it's just not a great way to plan a city or plan neighborhoods uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And I say that as a professional planner in my, my other life. So I, I think that's something we need to come together. Uh, Councilor Marula, as you know, has asked the, uh, the ministry to change the rules, asked them to slow down, stop the, their, uh, the way they do things. Uh, and uh, we've talked about it a little bit uh, around council and, and, uh, and we'll talk about it on a Thursday, I suspect, in the joint committee. Uh, but I think we need to do that together. It would be much more powerful than, uh, than city council saying one thing and perhaps the trustees having to, to say something else. Uh, coming together as Hamilton, uh, the two uh, governance uh, organizations, education and, and city, uh, and, and uh, folks in the neighborhoods, I think would be a tremendously powerful way to go to the province of Ontario. So I, I thank you for being here. It's a very difficult experience. Uh, you've already been through the 10 or so, I bet, uh, ARC meetings, uh, which are very hard to, to be at, but being here tonight is important, and my sense is the uh, trustees are listening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. Next delegate we have is M. Campbell. Hi, good evening. My name is Marnie Campbell. How you doing? Um, and tonight I come to you as a member of the community, and being a community member, I'm concerned. I believe that communities are built around schools. As the board slogan states, all schools are great schools, and that's really why everybody is here, because we think all of our schools are great. That's why we're here. 
When I look at numbers of student spaces in a few of our schools listed in the option, some are well over capacity, yet still slated for closure, and some that do not show being anywhere near capacity at this time are still slated to remain open. While making your best decision, I do hope that you, the criteria that our committee was given to work from will be looked at by you in depth and taken into great consideration as well, as this was one of our main points of direction, you know, really looking at capacity. Um, with creating super schools from JK to eight, will our grade sixes to eights be prepared for grade nine? Will they still have the opportunity to be taught by specialized teachers and receive you know, gym five days a week, a full science program and a music program? Also with middle school, this is the opportunity for, um, to offer extracurricular activities. Once again, preparing them for that high school experience. Sorry, Middle school is a time when we start to prepare students to be independent thinkers and learners. We are preparing them to shine before grade nine. Having a larger, in, um, sorry, inter, sorry, intermediate division means more opportunity for students to be the best they can before again they start that way crazy high school journey. Um, for me personally, transportation. What happened with our board's initiative for students to walk to school? With some of these options, walkability is hardly even an option. And, and where are we getting that funding for the transportation? Where are we housing those buses? How long, you know, little children on buses at four years old, yikes. Also a concern of mine is the possibility of lost green space. We have the property that offers space for uh, a new build as well as keeping a large area for green space available for all the use with playing fields and also something that's near a recreation center that will support the board's um, swimming program for grade threes, again, with a walkability expectation. And again, what was just talked about, finances. It always comes down to the pennies. Do we have the funding to support a new building? Do all those new buildings, not just in elementary, but in secondary. We have lots of money that we're putting out into new possible new builds. Or additions to schools, classrooms, washrooms, gyms, what is the best result? I don't think anybody really knows. Um, in regards to our own art process, um, as a parent of three children that live in the Central Mountain, I have been bamboozled with not one, but two art processes. The first arc process, the secondary arc, the hammer fell at the end of September and the, we were in and involved in an elementary arc the next week. We as members of the Central Mountain Committee, committee community, we didn't get an opportunity to sit and process, or I didn't, process what happened in the second, secondary arc where I was smashed right into the middle of what was happening for my children in the elementary arc. There was no breathing time. There was no mourning process, no really to get your head wrapped around what just happened to you. Is there not an opportunity for a breathing process for communities? Have we had a community where this has happened? Both arcs have happened, bam, bam, and we're in the middle here. That's where trust comes in because we don't know what's going on, right? Communities don't know what's going on and we need that. Um, We've been told throughout our process that you are listening to our communities. And I'm just wondering, when we go to our, our trustee was there. Sometimes it gets lost in trans, translation when the information comes back to you. Is there not a small delegation that could perhaps take turns coming to hear firsthand what our communities are saying? Sometimes, like I said, it gets lost in the translation when you're reading it and how you interpret it is not necessarily how the parent had presented it at the meeting. I think that we need to be hands-on for that. Uh, I know that you know some trustees did show up and I do appreciate those ones that were at ours. Um, I'm also hoping that perhaps this will get shared with families as well um, and community, how this process not only affects our families and our children, but how it affects our staffing, teachers, administrations, administrators, caretakers. With closures of any school, somebody's losing a job. I don't care who it is, but there is somebody's gonna be out of work. Somebody's family is being you know, disrupted in that. Um, sorry. As, and people are being moved around. Just because a school stays open does not guarantee that your staff is going to stay with that school. There's that you know, line of everybody's 
got their job to do. But I don't think that people, we realize that as parents. And the only reason why I'm aware of that is I've been through the secondary arc. And it means everybody's up for grabs, you know, the, the jobs are seniority based. But I don't think people realize that. We can't keep all these teachers if we're letting schools go like that. Um, in this situation, no one truly wins. Transition is just as confusing as an art process. Education is education, and all of our children will receive an education wherever they end up going. It's just unfortunate that our communities have to pay the price. Thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Kay Clark. Good evening, trustees. This process so far has been a long, arduous, and a challenge for all involved. I would like to thank all of the members of the ARC Committee for their hard work and dedication to the schools involved. I have attended most of the public meetings, and I am concerned and disgusted by the way a fellow school in the ARC has treated the other schools, parents, and concerned citizens by bullying, taking over meetings, and comments made in print and social media. I thought the number one reason that we are so passionate about this process and our schools was for our children and their respective futures. In the end, it won't really matter what school our children attend, it's that they get a quality education and are in a caring, nurturing environment and that they're able to flourish. I hope that once this process is complete, that the parents will not pass negative attitudes or feelings onto their children for the new school they may be attending or the new schoolmates they will be receiving. I am concerned about the children of the parents having a pre negative or preconceived notion when our children attend their school or they go to ours. It is disheartening that the children may suffer in the end from this. I hope that it will be water under the bridge when the decision is made, but words can sting. The logic of Geo Armstrong being adapted makes common sense as it has the largest capacity. It's centrally located to all potential students and it also has the advantage of currently being a JK-8 to school, which the board has established as one of their guiding principles. The multiple criticisms and negative comments regarding why Geo Armstrong should close can be easily addressed by reasonable upgrades and renovations that can be done once we are out of this process. It has also been brought up multiple times that the children with special needs will not be accommodated at the largest school in the ARC, which is untrue as they're currently being accommodated as per their needs. My question to the school that's bringing this forward, how many children live in your area and how many are outside of the school's catchment area? Comments have been made that GL Armstrong would be too big and no one will know them. Mr. Trimble, the teachers, and students know each other. This is achieved through the multiple programs that are offered at the school that allows the children of all ages and grades to have opportunities to interact with each other, which leads to the school feeling like everyone knows you and your name. It makes me feel like when I was going to grade school in the small town I grew up, everyone knew each other. The atmosphere is inviting and welcoming at GL Armstrong, and the staff and students are cheerful and helpful. If the staff recommendation goes through, then all of the schools will be deemed large. One of the options that was offered would have my daughter attend three schools before she even hits high school. She is in JK. How is that to give the children a stable learning environment and the ability to make and maintain friends? I agree that there should be JK to eight schools with minimal transitions, but in some cases, this may not be able to occur. I find it interesting that the board staff are not close to one of the options and are not endorsing the options brought forth unlike the other elementary arcs currently occurring in the city. I don't envy the board for this tremendous task ahead of them. I hope that they take all of the information and recommendations from all parties involved in the process and are not just the squeaky, listening to the squeaky wheel as we are all passionate about our kids and the schools they attend. We can only hope that the decision that the school board trustees make will be the best for the Central Mountain and the students affected. I am sure that all the schools will welcome the new students, parents, teachers, and support staff with open arms into the school family. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, we'd like to welcome our MPP for Hamilton Mountain, Monique Taylor. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for allowing me the time to, uh, to come and speak to you. I know that as a board, the decisions that you are facing around school closures are very difficult. And they're difficult because they affect the decisions on families and the communities in the schools that they serve. 
as demonstrated by the people who are here this evening. People in our neighbourhoods feel a strong attachment to their schools. They see them not just as an important part of their community, but as a focal point of the neighbourhoods that they live in. That is a testament to the work that is done in our school system by our teachers, principals, support staff, all educational workers. But it also reflects these decisions directly affect their lives. Many families chose to move to a particular neighbourhood, particularly because of the proximity to a school. Perhaps it was because they had heard good things about that school, but in many cases, it was the benefit of having a school within walking distance. And that made a huge quality and a difference in their lives. When making the single biggest investment in their lives, school location was foremost in their minds. But as demographics change, we see the declining enrollment in some of these schools. And you, as the school board, are faced with some very tough decisions. Not surprisingly, those decisions are met with strong opinions from the public and for very good reason. Unfortunately, those decisions are made even more difficult by the rules that have been handed down to you by the province. The biggest problem, as I see, is the funding formula which is based on an outdated view that schools are just classrooms for education only. It relies too heavily on the enrollment numbers and denies you, as a school board, the opportunity to explore a school's full potential. I'll say to you tonight what I have said in the legislature. We need to see schools as more than, than that. We need to see them as hubs in our community that are also a home to a range of services that meet the needs of the children and the communities that we live in. With a different funding formula, they can be used for health services, they can be used for recreation, and they can be used to deliver social services. We've also heard that they're being used as daycare facilities. If the government were to loosen the shackles, we would have the opportunity to look beyond the, um, the numbers of students involved and to think creatively about how our schools can be best used and preserve the vitality of the neighbourhoods throughout Hamilton. In 2009, the Declining Enrollment Working Group released its report, which included a number of recommendations that all new provincially funded services and programs, not just under the responsibility of the Ministry of Education, be housed in schools unless they were able to, pro to prove for a compelling reason of why they should not be there. The government needs to follow through on that recommendation. The accommodation review process itself is mandated by the province although some adjustments are able to be made to make small tweaks from the local boards. It can be extremely time consuming for the participants and it can be very divisive with a tendency to pit schools and communities against each other. I've met and I've talked with many parents throughout this process. They are desperately trying find, to find ways to keep their school open. The natural process has become that with the word of their school closing means they're making comparison with other schools. This is not the approach that they want to take because they understand that other families in other parts of the city are feeling exactly the same way as themselves. But the process puts them in that position and we see it not just in Hamilton but we're seeing it right across the province. From one end of Ontario to the other, the school closure process are being contested and they're filled with conflict. With a different approach from the provincial government, declining enrollment can provide an opportunity not only to update per pupil attendant allocations in the formula, but also to rethink the use of school buildings. And in some cases, policy for sharing school space which encourages more cooperation between schools and other services and could save money. My message to you this evening is a commitment that upon returning to the legislature I will fight for a change to the funding formula, a commitment for change to the current structure of school usage and a review of the current ministry's art process. 
I have heard the request for a hold on this process un until after the June 12th election. I would hope that you're taking that into consideration. I really do thank you for your time this evening and I, I congratulate all the participants for all the hard work that they've done throughout the ARC process. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monique. Next, we have G. Bayer. Bayer. Give me a second here. Take your time, but not too much time. I'm an engineer, so I got a MacGyver something for myself here. All right. Okay, good evening, trustees. Uh, my name is George Bayer. Uh, I came to this country 30 years ago not speaking any English, and attended Linden Park Elementary School as an ESL student. Now I stand before you as a professional engineer, a 12-year Hill Park Block resident, and most importantly, a parent of two kids that will be attending Linden Park School next fall, just like daddy. And uh, my plea is obviously to keep Linden Park School open. Um, I would ask you to please consider ARC option number one is the best solution. And the reasons to keep Linden Park are quite substantial, and I'll address them right now. Um, we as the Linden Park community stand on the verge of total scholastic annihilation, essentially. Um, we already lost Hill Park High School, the Ontario Early Years Centre, and now with one decision, we stand to lose Linden Park Elementary School and today's parent daycare. Not only that, but we're on the verge of losing our playground, a vast, beautiful green space that is used every day by the community for a myriad of sports, recreation, and activities, basically you would completely obliterate that block. Your decision to close the school would affect far more people than just our children and families, so please don't decimate our block. The second reason to keep Linden Park Elementary open is that you would be closing down the most geographically convenient school for yourselves. Topographically, Linden Park is located at the epicenter from which all other schools radiate. This means that Linden Park is the only school which has equally distant access to each and every school's catchment zone. This unique feature would allow for future planning changes and occasional student shifts to be more readily accommodated. It will allow for some more wiggle room, if you will. Also, because Linden Park is in the epicenter of the Central Mountain School Zone, there's a radial 360 degree sweep of catchment area. And what that means is that Linden Park has the largest area for catchment within a one kilometer radius. This is very important, especially for the number of kids walking to school. And you can see that from the map. No other school has this complete 360 degree catchment sweep. So this location makes the school very universal and unique. It's like the bullseye. This is the reason you would require only two more school buses as opposed to three school buses with the other ARC option. This is $100,000 savings right off the bat, and consider the annual savings as well. Linda Park has other features like the ease of accessibility for handicapped children as the school has one floor plan. Other schools would require elevator installations. Also, by keeping Linda Park School open, you would retain higher utilization numbers of 96% versus only 89% if the school closed. And immediate space utilization could be increased even further by having the Ontario Early Years Centre moved to Linden Park School. This option is happily supported by Deb Forrester, the Associate Director of the Ontario Early Years Centre and today's Family Child Care. What a great way to keep our parental resources local. I spoke with her last night actually, face to face. Nice lady. And she's more than willing to come to Linden Park Elementary. What a great way. They would take a classroom of yours Kids that have older siblings that go to the school would go to their programming, and then the early year center would, would do programming with the parent or the younger child. It's a symbiotic relationship, win-win. The Hill Park Early Year Center is very popular. Last year it saw over 10,500 visits alone, 10,725 to be exact, which is a clear indication of the immediate need in our community for this valuable resource. I don't need to tell you that the Ontario Early Year Center in the Lime Ridge Mall closed down. So all those people from there are now coming to Hill Park, and a lot of them walk, and I know because I go there. Um, the Ministry of Education agrees that establishing family literacy programs is the most effective strategy to increase parental involvement and literacy development. 
The Ontario Early Years Centre fosters these relationships between parents and children through their drop-in programs and workshops. This program is programming positively influences children's literacy before even kindergarten. And I speak personally to this as both of my kids frequent the centre. So please don't take that away from us as well. Actually, there's one lady that's got this shopping cart. It's got four seats on it. She goes there every morning and she loads these kids on the shopping cart and she pushes them down and she walks like a lot of people walk there. Not only that, but there's people from Ancaster, Binbrook that bust their kids there because it's an awesome, awesome resource. Very, very valuable for our community. Now, the main reason for all these school closures was to reduce the number of pu pupil places. Try to say that 10 times. With Linden Park staying open, you reduce 828 pupil places. And if Linden Park closes, only 667 pupil places would be reduced. So keeping Linden Park open makes sense. In addition, the provincial government is spending money to upgrade the school to be full day kindergarten ready. Included with the upgrades to kindergarten, there will be money spent to repair the washrooms, playground, and provide new equipment. It would be a shame to have all this work done on the school and then just level it to the ground. This would be a waste of resources and most of all, public capital. Linden Park's enrollment has seen substantial increase over the past few years. This enrollment is strong compared to other schools. There's even a possibility for a third kindergarten class. So keeping Linden Park open would mean less disruption to more children. That's a great formula. As you all know, there's a good number of disabled children attending the school. Some of these children require extra special care that the school already provides and is trained for. Keeping the school open would mean minimal interruptions to their daily routine. And I can't think of a better way to restore faith in your community than that. Lastly, I also move that all the financial criteria be removed from consideration. This is a strong argument which is readily supported by the Ellis Engineering paper delivered to the superintendent on February 4th, 2014. This paper outlines some very significant errors. The, page, the paper, which was produced by a reputable professional engineering firm specializing in multi-million dollar civil construction projects, has made it abundantly clear. The report states, the ARC cannot be reasonably expected to reach an informed decision based on financial information known to contain significant errors. For example, there were errors found to be in the thousandth percentile range, which is completely unacceptable. I mean, this means the decimal place was essentially put in the wrong place. So you're talking a difference of $2 million versus $20 million. That's substantial to me. So we need reliable data if we are to use these results to decide the future outcome for our children and the livelihoods of hundreds of families. In closing, I appeal to your hearts as well as your rationale. For the rational skeptic, Linden Park should stay open because of its central location. Higher utilization numbers, less busing required, and a collaborative community hub that offers family support through the Ontario Early Years and today's Family Child Care Centres. For the financial skeptic, the numbers are not reliable. They should not be used until correctly reviewed. And I say that even though some of the numbers were favorable for keeping Linden Park open. But most importantly, we need to restore the public school board's faith back into the Hill Park community. Because this single act, because this single act will have long lasting consequences. It's a domino effect. And I know you guys have a tough decision. I got lots of love to give to you guys, um, really. Um, best of luck. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in your seat. That's probably why I'm not. Anyways. So basically what you vote on will affect us for a very long time. And most people that I talk with in the neighborhood, and I've talked with many people, given out flyers, and I've been there for 12 years, are very upset about the Hill Park High School closure, let alone when I tell them that Linden Park Elementary School, the Ontario Early Years, and today's parent child care centers would be closed as well. So th there is a little bit of despair and, and sadness in our community. I mean, it's just the way it is especially with just so much riding on one closure. You know, it's not just one elementary school. There's a high school, it's pretty much all the other programming. It's, it's just a block. That block's gonna go be a smoking war zone. So I plead with you now, on behalf of my small children, on behalf of my neighbors, and on behalf of my community, please keep Linden Park School open. Because if you close that, everything else goes with it. And um, we literally, literally will have nothing left. 
So thank you guys. Best of luck. Thank you very much for those words. Next we have L. Wilson. Welcome. Yeah, it's plug and play. So do you have a memory stick with you? Yeah. Yeah, we'll give a, you a couple minutes to uh, get that set up. Good evening, my name is Lee Wilson. I'm a resident of the Central Mountain. I'm a parent of a young child at Queensdale. And I have been attending the ARC meetings throughout this process. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak to the trustees and to the board staff tonight. Um, an opportunity to voice my concerns about the pending closures in our community. Um, which are obvious. I think a lot of similar issues have come up tonight that I saw brought up at the ARC meetings. Specific, specific concerns that I have had um, have to do with maintaining the walkability of our schools, minimizing the division of the student bodies, and the transitions that our kids are going to have to go through. Um, when the board auction that's currently um, public now came out, it did seem that some of these concerns have been considered, because I did note that a lot of the areas of the map um, you know, there was a school remaining open in each area, ma maintaining the walkability of the schools for, for the kids. And the other aspect of the proposal that was quite positive was that all the schools were to be JK to eight, which I think is, you know, an excellent idea because they're going to go through a tough transition when school closures um, happen, but to have to go through another one in a few years would have been difficult. So I, I did like that aspect of the, the board proposal. Tonight I want to focus specifically on the walkability aspect because it's something that's very important to our community um, for a lot of reasons. We like our kids to get the daily exercise for health reasons obviously, but also the social interactions that they have with their peers, with their neighbours, other members of the community as they walk to and from school. Um, environmental reasons, not using cars as much on the road, these are all good reasons to uh, really encourage our kids to walk or bike to school. But it's not just our community that considers this a very important issue, and that's kind of what I wanted to emphasize tonight, was to show you some um, uh, examples of initiatives or movements that are going on through the province and nationally that really underscore the importance of this issue. So this first slide is taken from something that Metrolinx agency is doing. That They're a uh, government of Ontario agency that has been tasked to improve, coordinate, integrate modes of transport in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. One of the things they've done is implement a plan for active and sustainable school travel. Um, their plan is called the Big Move, and they have a vision of seeing 60% of children in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area walk or cycle to school by 2031. Um, and I, I think the reason this really has come about is it is concerning that a poll in 2011 showed that only 36% of kids were walking to and from school in Ontario, compared to 53% in 1985, so that's a pretty big drop. As part of this initiative, uh, school travel planning projects have been set up um, through Toronto and Hamilton. One was called Stepping It Up. It took place from 2009 to 2011. I'm just gonna talk briefly about this project's results. So what it was, it was to try to encourage schools to um, promote walking to the, their, the kids, or cycling, basically active transportation, non-motorized vehicles. Uh, it was introduced at 30 elementary schools in the Toronto and Hamilton area. And it included things like walk to school days or creating organized walking groups, um, supporting further crossing guard services. And it did have an impact. They saw a 7% decrease in morning car trips and a 3% decrease in the afternoon. But I think more important than that was the sort of feelings that it generated in the principals and teachers and students that were asked about it. Um, they said there was a much less mayhem in the morning. It was a lot nicer, the morning drop off when there were more walkers. Um, 
the kids reported feeling you know, energetic when they got to school, being able to concentrate more on their schoolwork. They enjoyed the, the time they had with their peers in the morning and afternoon. And really the independence that it generated in the kids was a big plus. Another Ontario group that has really put an emphasis on this is the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. In June of 2012, they came out with um, a call to action to municipalities, government, uh, planners, and the public um, to promote healthy communi communities and planning for active transportation. And basically, this, um, this plan is uh, they want to make non-motorized means of travel a mainstay of daily life in Ontario communities. And they maintain that walking and cycling networks should be an integral part of the planning process when any communities are planned in Ontario. And within this plan, they, they did give an overview of the benefits of active transportation, many of which I've already mentioned, but obviously the health benefits, you know, the physical, it really allows our, our kids to almost meet their daily exercise requirements if they're walking to and from school. The mental health as well by this increased social interaction. The safety is something that was brought up in this um, call to action. You know, if, if communities can be planned around, you know, better cycling uh, lanes or, um, you know, the complete street, as they call it, that allows pedestrian traffic. It will increase the safety of our kids walking to and from school. And if more kids walk to school, drivers are more aware of them on the street. I've mentioned already the environmental impact, um, again, the social impact, and also the economical. You can imagine if we can take a lot of traffic off the street, the wear and tear in the roads, and certainly from the, the school board's perspective, less school buses has an economical benefit. Finally, a national movement that I'll mention that's dedicated to children's mobility, health, and happiness is the Active and Safe Routes to School movement. And they actually recently published a cost and benefits analysis of all these different uh, school travel planning projects that have been going on, like the Stepping It Up one within Hamilton. And they found a benefit cost ratio of 1.8, so that's very positive. So for a cost of about $93,000 a year to run these programs, they saw an annual health and societal benefit of over 200,000. So what they're saying is there is a point to really promoting um, you know, our kids walking or cycling to school. Uh, finally, as I said from the beginning, I am a parent of a child in, at Queensdale School. And I'll just say right off the bat, everybody walks to Queensdale. That's part of the school culture. And um, when you know, it was proposed that Queensdale might close and we might move to Armstrong, the concern was for a lot of those families who would live outside the walkable area, it would completely change their routines and their, you know, having to drive or take the bus would have been very difficult change for, for those families. And I'm just putting the maps up here so you can see. Um, the one on the left shows the uh, boundary for Armstrong. In orange, it's for the younger kids, and blue is the older kids. And the other map obviously shows the Queensdale region. There is a little bit of overlap, but it appears about two thirds of the space of the Queensdale map would be you know, no longer walkable if, if that school was closed and they were moved to the next closest school. So it's really important to, I know Queensdale families, and I think the whole community, to try to keep schools within walkable distance for most families. Um, from a personal perspective, my son's in JK of Queensdale. We've only been there a short time, but the real community feel of the school has been amazing to me. And as we walk to school and meet the other kids and families on the schoolyard, everyone is so welcome. There's a real community feel. I'm just floored by all, you know, how my son suddenly knows the names of all these older kids and almost all the members of staff. Um, I think, you know, walking to school and having that social time is a big part of that. And that is all I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have A. Aldersma. Alder Aldersma. Aldersma. That's pretty. Hey, I wasn't bad. <laughs> Welcome. You mind if I move this? Absolutely. Okay. I'll be the first person to carry it while I'm. Ooh. I'm kind of short, so. So, hi, my name is Alyssa Aldersma. <laughs> and I'm 18 years old, and I'm a former Queensdale student. Before Queensdale, I went to six different elementary schools because my family liked to move, apparently. It's safe to say that I had a rocky childhood. At all these different schools, I walked around completely invisible. Everybody ignored me. When I went to Queensdale, I was afraid I was just gonna be 
like every other school, I was going to be another number or another student. I was mistaken. Queensdale welcomed me with open arms. The entire community was friendly and welcoming. I even met my first friend in the middle of summer. Who does that? Queensdale made me who I am today. I learned sign language from Lee Rossi, the head of the hard of hearing class, which would cease to exist if Queensdale closes. I'm now a Mohawk student studying to become a child and youth worker. When I had to leave Queensdale at the end of grade six, I was devastated. Having to start all over again at a new school was very difficult. And the fact that it was a much bigger JK to eight school made me feel like an outsider again after only a short time in the Queensdale community. When you join a JK to eight school in grade seven, you're the new guy in a group of kids who have mostly been together since kindergarten. Friendships and cliques have already been formed. And the atmosphere is very much us versus them. In my personal experience anyway. Moving from schools is hard for kids. So why is it it's necessary for kids going to grade eight to nine, but why make it hard with the extra step from kids going to grade six to seven? I wish Queensdale had been JK to eight when I went there. When I heard it was a possibility and that the current Queensdale students could skip the extra step, I wanted to come here tonight and give you a student's perspective. Hope you will consider my spirit, my experience as you make your decision. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have C. Trimmins. Christine Trimmins and I'm a parent at Queensdale Elementary School. Before I begin, I would like to thank the Trustees School Board for carefully considering the information presented today and coming up with um, the staff options that we at Queensdale community feel we can support. I have to say I'm a little bit nervous today, so bear with me. <laughs> I'm probably as red as the Queensdale colors I'm wearing today. <laughs> um, um, but it was really important for me to be here and um, speak on the important things and uh, what makes Queensdale exceptional. Um, I wanted to first take a moment to share a little bit about the wonderful Umbrella Family Child Care Program that my son attends at Queensdale School. Julie Jacobs, known as Miss Julie, is a dynamic program supervisor that runs this unique, high-quality program that is based on current research and recent philosophies. Julie's children Julie views children as competent and capable thinkers and motivates their learning by making it joyful and meaningful to each child. The children who attend this program have a sense of belonging. They feel that they are valuable contributors to their program. My son, along with his peers, can grow along with this program, a program that cultivates authentic and caring relationships by a nurturing, knowledgeable, and responsive adult. When I get together often, uh, with friends, I find they share the same complaint. It's uh, very difficult to pull out um, information about how their child's day was at daycare and um, at school. But I find when I ask my son how his day was, he gives me a lengthy list of, uh, of wide range opportunities that include academics, recreation, the arts, and enriched activities. That alone says so much to me about the quality of care and education that he is experiencing. This particular program is also unique because of its long-standing relationship with the Umbrella family, with the Umbrella staff and Queensdale family. It is unique in the way it is integrated into the school. Often shared space can be difficult as we know, but not the case for Queensdale. They have welcomed the Umbrella program with open arms from the beginning 10 years ago. They have developed a strong, harmonious, and supportive relationship that ensures that the children experience a seamless day. Ms. Jacobs, the Umbrella Staff Supervisor, is often seen volunteering in many school events. She lends helping hands on school trips, and she attends all of this on her own time. Um, I wanted to mention this because this gives a glimpse of the attachment people feel towards the school and the strong relationship that they share. I feel I can speak on this relationship because I worked in the Umbrella Program over five years ago, and it was such a positive experience for me that I realized how special Queensdale was then. 
I, I have had many experiences over the years working in dozens of schools across Hamilton and the surrounding areas, but nothing compared to the connectedness that I felt at Queensdale. I often said to others my time spent at Queensdale had felt as if I had stepped into a time machine or sucked through a porthole and ended up in a perfect, wholesome 50s type TV show. This cozy, small town feeling um, where, the, where I had the pleasure of having interactions with such kind, extremely respectful, empathetic and compassionate kids amazed me every day. This feeling was due to the responsive, safe, caring and inclusive environment that the school administrators, teaching staff, daycare staff, school staff, students, and community members created. And when it was time for my child to approach the age where he would be entering the school, it was important for me to return to Queensdale community, and it was the best decision I ever made. I wanted to return to an educational facility where I observed students and adults and peers that cared about their learning as well as about them individually. I wanted to return to a school that the school, where the school and child care program supported the needs of each child, family, and the community by building on their strengths and ability. I feel valued at this school. I'm encouraged to be an active participant and contributor. The school already has such a hold on my son's heart. It has been a, a vital part of his development of sense, self, sense of self, health, and well-being, and even in such a short time, my son's in junior kindergarten. I support the community's desire to keep Queensdale open because I anticipate decades and decades of successful lifelong learners exiting that building on graduation day from their community school. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Next we have M. Aikman. Alyssa, I'm with you. Um, my name is Murray Aikman, and I thank you for this opportunity this evening to speak to the trustees of the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. I would like to relate to you two separate um, times in my life that I think mirror themselves in many ways and have relevance to our discussion tonight with the art uh, process. I never thought I'd say this, but I am now one of the older residents in the Queensdale neighborhood. <clears throat> However, I did grow up in the neighborhood, and uh, I have lived in it for a good part of my life. I attended Queensdale from kindergarten to grade six, not too many years after it opened in 1948. And like the previous speaker, it was a very special environment. It was a time when Queensdale uh, Central Mountain area was developing and taking shape. A lot of new families were moving in to the area and it was just growing immensely. And uh, it teamed with young children who attended the school as well as frequented the nearby parks and hung out at the nearby variety stores. The school was at capacity to the extent that an addition was added in the early 50s. The gymnasium was used for classrooms, believe it or not and there were two portable classrooms called Quonset huts of the day uh, on the playground. As children, we thrived in an almost leave it to beaver atmosphere of friends. We walked to and from school daily with them. We rode our bicycles around the neighborhood. It was a very carefree existence. We knew all of our teachers, several of them lived not that far away from the school. They even walked to school. They'd meet the children on their way. I know this sounds kind of hokey, but that's what made it so special, and that's why people want to keep the school open and retain that flavor. So we felt very secure, safe, and happy there. But even before that, in the 50 years before my friends and myself came along, there were people living in that neighborhood. It was supposed to have developed in the early 1900s, but didn't quite take off until after the Second War. But there were children uh, living in the, in the area, attending Brantdale and Onteora schools, if any of you remember them. And at the same time, there was another constant in the neighborhood, and that was the local church, Olivet United Church. And it had been founded in 1915, 
And interestingly enough, there was a man living in the area uh, named Joseph Pym who owned lots of land and don't know why, but he did. And he decided to donate property for a church because he felt that's in those days, that's what helped bring a community together. But he was way ahead of the curve because he didn't want just a church for a particular denomination. He wanted one that was inclusive that would encompass five denominations. And he made sure that happened and he put his money up front and it did happen. And this church was 10 years ahead of itself because in 1925, what was called the United Church of Canada came into being. But in any case, this church became another focal point in the community. And the point is that the children of that time utilized that church. And in 1949, when the church was rebuilding and Queensdale had just opened, guess what? Queensdale, the board in its wisdom, I guess, offered that facility to the church as a place to gather for a year while that all happened. And so during the 50s, after that, in the 60s, both the church and the community thrive. Um, and they continue the legacy and stability and inclusiveness that Mr. Pym had brought about. And that it continues to this, this day. It's an intangible but it's there, it's very real. And anybody that speaks about Queensville this evening and already has, has uh, mentioned just that special feeling of warmth and family-like atmosphere. Um, 1998, Queensville had its 50th anniversary reunion. I was very happy to be a part of that. And at that time, we, of course, met up with our former, friend, or former our past friends and uh, students and uh, teachers. And again, we were able to share memories and it was the very type of thing I'm speaking of with now. Then when I became, uh, got out of university, I decided to become a teacher. I ended up working for this Board of Education for 30 years. And my first pro, uh, school was Strathcona in the West End. And believe me, that was a change from the mountain. However, it was a great change because I came to love it. And what I'm trying to say here is, there was a parallel. And the parallel is, that's a great neighborhood. The Queensdale neighborhood is a great neighborhood. And it's because they're stable, they have a history. And there was something I came to recognize once I was teaching the children out in the West End. And that is that they love their community, they love their school, and what's wrong with that? That's what has happened at Queensdale, and it certainly is worth maintaining. Um, Several generations have attended that West End School, just like they have at Queensdale. And one of the strengths of that is, if you have a school of 250 to 300 children, for a lot of the reasons outlined tonight, it works. I found it worked when I was teaching them. We knew every child in that school. We could help them, whether they were our, in our class or not. They knew us, they understood us, we knew the parents coming along. It was just a super relationship. And as I moved from school to school on the board, they were all junior schools, same experience each time. And so even if Queensdale is expanded to grade seven and eight, that's not a great increase in numbers. It's still very workable. Uh, I think it's something that would fit. And maintaining and sustaining Queensdale is a great opportunity to truly return to the focus of education where it really belongs, we not just say it belongs, it does belong to the kids, to the students. And not ruled by numbers and bottom lines and things like that, although we understand they're important. Uh, last fall, a lady named Margaret Shimba wrote a very enlightening article in The Spectator in which she focused on the value of neighborhood schools as centers of education, not contained in the super mega building and with a minimum of busing. And what she was saying is what uh, we're hearing tonight. It begins with a young child, JK, kindergarten, grade one, who's able to walk that short distance to school with their family, their friends, their parents. Uh, it's a very healthy start to the day. They come in, relax, ready to go. They hit them just hopped off a school bus that's been bouncing around the neighborhood for the last half hour. They're, they're at peace, they're ready to go. Um, closing a Queen's Hill would mean that students can no longer do that. We need to remember that these are elementary students. They're not grade seven, not grade eight who can handle the walking. They're elementary students. 
and this is of great value to them to be able. I watch them go by the house every day. I sit out there, one of my great joys is watching these kids go back and forth to school and seeing the interaction that's going on and afterwards as well. It, the neighborhood is alive, it's living, it's vibrant, and that matters and it means a lot. Um, so having a grade sevens and eights in the school would be great. Um, it's not the big box schools that was alluded to later. 600, 700 children, I don't know how that works. I wouldn't want to be in one. I wouldn't want to work in one. Although I'm sure those who do would say they're fine. But personally, I think 300, 350, something like that's wonderful. Um, just one last thing. There was a once very thriving neighborhood on the other side of Upper James Street. And there was a school there called Brantdale. It closed in 1977. We all understand why, and those students come to Queensdale, came to Queensdale. What happened as well, though, Mohawk School College was coming on track about the same time, and eventually the student housing and the uh, influence of all of that has done a very detrimental things to that Branttail neighborhood to the point now where house values have dropped. Uh, that side of Upper James versus the other side. And that's a reality that homeowners like to keep in mind too because uh, homes that get sold over there, they're not going to new par uh, families with kids so often. They're going to the person from out of town, just like happens elsewhere. They buy up the house, it becomes student housing. And you know, those people are trying to get an education too, but it has had its downside. Our neighborhood is really experiencing a turnover. Houses go up for sale, they're not on the market long, and they're gone. And many of them are coming to be inhabited by young families with children. So I can only say that I have to give kudos to the parents of, of Queensdale School for their very colorful and sincere uh, support of a neighborhood which as the fr a school which as the very first elementary school on the mountain after the war has served the Central Mountain for 65 years. It's a walkable neighborhood and this school is it's a legacy to the community's stable past that goes back to the days of Mr. Pym forward and it would be a shame to see it lost. So I'm very much in favor of uh, keeping Queensdale going and uh, wish everyone well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we call the next speaker, uh, E. Pachette, we just want to let folks know that we are going to take a break after the next speaker, V. Taylor. So V. Taylor wants to stand by the sidelines. Um, we'll do that delegation and then we'll take a short five minute break and then come and then complete the second half of the delegations. You have the floor. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Eileen Patchett. I began teaching in Hamilton in 1963 and I retired from Queensdale School in 2000. I taught at several schools. Unlike Murray, I taught at some of those big schools and some of the small ones, various sizes, configurations, different areas of the city. When I began teaching, parental involvement was very minimal, very few volunteers. But when I came to Queensdale in 1986, I was very impressed with the way parents were so involved with their children's schooling. And as time went on, I became even more impressed with the way the community as a whole invested in the success of the school and of its students. I feel fortunate that I was able to finish my teaching career with 14 years at Queensdale. So much so that since I retired for the past 14 years, I have continued to volunteer there to give back to the community that so welcomed me. Now the art process required looking at a lot of things, facilities, conditions, quality teaching and learning, environment, transportation, walkability, safety, value to students and the community, green space and so on, to address just a few. In just the last eight years, Queensdale's received a state-of-the-art boiler, full air conditioning throughout, updated electrical and plumbing, new lighting, windows, exit doors, student washrooms, entrance and exit stairs and ramps and repainting. All areas of the school are accessible to our students with wheelchairs and walkers except for the actual stage. 
And since the deaf heart and hard of hearing program in Hamilton began here in the 1960s, it's been well adapted to meet the needs of our hearing impaired students. Queensdale is on a residential street in the middle of a very safe, walkable neighborhood. Only special ed students are bused, all others are in walking distance. There's almost no bullying. The children show a remarkable degree of empathy for other students. Now in 1986, when I started, there were five deaf and hard of hearing classes. Those students came to us from as far away as Brantford and St. Catharines, and they have always been an integral and integrated part of our school. Many of the students and teachers took extra classes to learn signing to help communicate with them. And even though at present there is only one hard of hearing classroom, classes still often sign parts of their presentations at assemblies to include them. Now outside, Queensdale has a huge paved playground and a grassy playing field at the back of the property and as well in the front, a huge treed park-like setting with gardens planted and maintained by the parents. You often see students outside there for science, environmental studies, phys ed. On hot summer days, reading under the trees in the shade is wonderful. It has a dedicated French room, learning resource room, and as Christine spoke of, a wonderful umbrella program that provides absolutely exceptional care. Many young parents have moved into our area just because of the great reputation of both the school and the community. Many from outside our catchment area have applied to attend Queensdale, but had to be refused because Queensdale was under ARC review. Staff turnover is minimal. I, like so many of my colleagues, feel privileged have been able to teach at Queensdale until my retirement. In 28 years of association with the school, I can't tell you how many times visiting teachers, occasional teachers have told me, Queensdale's just a little slice of heaven. It's a great, it's in a great community. Now last Tuesday, we heard a wonderful presentation from Millgrove. Our city fathers say Hamilton that it is the city of many communities. And I think they mean those amalgamated areas, Millgrove and all those Wentworth County areas that came together with the old city of Hamilton. But within the old Hamilton, there are also many communities. And Queensdale is indeed a very special one. When I began teaching in the library in 1986, I inherited some volunteers from my predecessor. And as much as the principal and the staff, those volunteers helped me learn about the students and the community that I've come to love. A few examples of the wonderful support that I received during my time teaching there. One volunteer traveled from Dundas every week because his son was in the hard of hearing program. One teacher who had never returned to teaching after a maternity leave came back and worked every week in a quiet corner of the library with those little grade ones who needed that little bit of extra one-on-one -on -one to make them become independent readers. One young stay-at-home mom traded off babysitting with her neighbor to look after the two little ones at home so she could come and help out in her grade five son's library. I regularly had 12, 13 volunteers. At that time, some schools didn't have that many, but that was just my room. Two of my volunteers decided after years of volunteering to go back to school and became teachers themselves. And of course, there was a neighbor who never had any children but she thought it was important for the community to help out where her neighbor's children went to school. In many, many schools I know, there are dozens of parents just like ours who help out every week in classrooms, pizza day, jump rope for heart, environment days, clean up Bruce Park day, so on. But how many schools have a mom and dad who on more than one occasion, on a really hot June day, would bring enough watermelons for the whole school, set up tables on the pavement, cut them up and serve them to every student in the school for a nice, refreshing, juicy treat at recess. How many have two fathers who took weeks to paint murals 
of the Four Seasons on the four walls of the library just to beautify their children's schools. How about the busy surgeon who found time to volunteer not just for trips, but on a regular basis in her daughter's classrooms? Or the nurses who worked around their 12-hour shifts so that they can volunteer regularly, not just for special occasions? The father came in with his musical instruments for their children's enrichment. The parents who organized and painted playground games out on our playground. The parents who started the annual Christmas store 20 years ago and still spend all year finding reasonably priced items so that for a minimal cost, every child can buy presents for everyone he wants to. And they wrap them up for them before they take them home. Then there are the young parents who joined the home and school to help at fun fair when it was a couple of years before their kids would be old enough to come to school. When the school focused on math literacy, parents held extra fundraisers so that they could raise money and presented $4,000 to the school to buy math manipulatives and other materials. The group of parents who worked secretly with the principal and the caretaker and over one weekend came in and painted, papered, got curtains, decorated, bought tables and new dishes for the staff room just to say thank you to the teachers. And of course, there's the Christmas carol sing every year. Started originally by a teacher for many, many years, run by a parent and his friends and community members. So on a chilly winter evening in December, the whole community's out on the front lawn at Queensdale. There's hot chocolate and cookies for all, lots of good singing, lots of fun, Lots of meeting the students, the teachers, the former students, the kids home from university, the neighbors who just live around the school, all enjoying that wonderful holiday tradition. One minute. Thank you. Any wonder teachers love such a neighborhood? Any wonder we want to stay there until we retire? No question at all. We want to be there to support the community that supports us. My own family, my son and his wife, bought their home so that their children could attend the school where I taught my daughter-in-law. Lots of young families moving into our neighborhood because they know Queensdale is just a great place to be. And lots of others who've tried to move in in the past year and have not been able to. Every day when I'm in there volunteering, only once a week, but every time I'm in, I look around and I say, that must be Jim's son. That's got to be Brooke's daughter. Oh, and that must be Erica's daughter. Those familiar faces from the past. And I'm seeing the next generation all over again. Now, there is a reason that parents want their children to attend a school like this. The small, walkable school in the middle of the neighborhood really is the village that's the best place to raise a child. Thank you very much. Next we have V. Taylor. Welcome. Hi. My name is uh, Vicki Taylor. Um, I'm here primarily to say that I endorse the revised staff recommendations that would allow um, Queensdale to expand from a JK to a grade eight school. I've lived across the school for almost 30 years. I'm, I have a grandson that I hope will attend that school, but not for three years, he's still pretty little. I have watched, I think, probably hundreds of moms and dads walk with babies in strollers and young children by hand, and then later when the children get older, walk themselves to school. There is a beautiful rhythm to the day when you have a school in your neighborhood. I admit to being nervous when I was asked to speak at this event because it's so important to my community. But then I remembered some comments that had been written on my own report cards in school. I had longed to have the comments from my friends that my friends got. They got 
Nancy is a pleasure to teach. Jane is a pleasure to teach. Beth is a pleasure to teach. They were all a pleasure to teach. Then mine said, Vicki laughs and talks too much. <laughs> so I thought, there it is on my permanent record. I like to talk, so I should perhaps do it here. And how can you not laugh in grade four when your social studies text is called Canada as a whole? <laughs> when I got involved in this, I wanted to try and understand the process and not just to react to the news of school closures in a negative way. I attended several working meetings and a lot of the public meetings. And as well, I did a lot of background reading on the history of arcs. It's so tempting to make a joke about arcs. <laughs> and I have to do it. <laughs> now, prior to this, I really had not paid much attention to the art process in the city, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that. I really only thought of arcs as being something like Noah's Ark, but then later, I, last year, I became more interested in Russell Crowe's Ark, the one that's supposed to be shaped like a box. At this time, I'd like to thank Superintendent Prendergast for making transcripts of the last public meeting. I'm hard of hearing, and these uh, printed transcripts were very helpful because it was often very hard to hear all the conversations, so thank you very much. The compliment of the ARCs, which was two parents and one teaching staff, surprised me because I thought it placed an enormous burden on the young parents who have to be among the busiest people in the city. Parents are working, usually. They work outside of the home, they work part-time, they work from home, and anyone who's not it has a, an employment, they're at home with the children. They're the ones that are working the most. And yet, this is the, it's, it makes sense that they would be part of the ARC process because they have children in school. But I was surprised that there were not community members um, included because they would have helped share the work. There were so many meetings to attend and complex data to study. And add to that the coldest, iciest winter in decades and you had a perfect storm of almost unbearable stress placed upon these ARC members. And yet they did it all, did all that was asked of them in an effort to meet the requirements of both the Board of Education and the Ministry of Education. They took those guidelines and they bent them like a gumby to come up with the plans that would take into consideration as many of the public's requests as possible too. And then the staff of the school board studied these options and revised their early recommendations. For all this work, I am truly grateful. I, would, I support this option which has Queensdale expanding to a JK to 8 school. It would keep the students in our neighborhood longer and we would get to see them turn into the lovely creature, the preteen. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Queensdale school is at the heart of a neighborhood and you've heard that before, from many people who spoke before me. It's actually called the Center Mount uh, neighborhood and as Murray said, it started to take shape in the early 1900s. There are homes there still that were farmhouses back when the mountain was still rural in nature. The most northern boundary is Bulls Lane, where there are very grand homes on the brow overlooking the city and the bay. I am not sure if those people are real because I've never seen them. But there is a, <laughs> but there is a certain glamour to having neighbors that have a private street. As the development progressed, some very forward thinkers uh, builders and developers made an effort to build homes that would attract people of all income levels. They built small homes that they called starter homes or retirement homes, and then larger family homes, of course. Not only were they thinking that people of different income levels should live together, but they wanted people at all stages of life to feel they belonged. And most of all, they wanted children from these varied families to go to school together. They thought that this would make the community more cohesive and I believe it has, and that has continued because we do have a mixture of what we would call professionals, doctors, dentists, lawyers, um, and then the white, uh, you know, white collar, pink collar, blue collar, Every, everybody lives together, goes to school together, except like I said, those guys on Bulls Lane, I don't know what I think. They go to a school where people with private streets you know, go. <laughs> and they did something right because we still have a diverse socioeconomic makeup and several generations of families live here. Students graduate, go off to start a career, have adventures, but come back to buy a house and raise their own families. The seniors who have the best gardens were once the young parents volunteering in the school. 
There is a unique comfort living in a place with so much continuity, yet it's still welcoming to young families. And the young families are coming at an increasing rate. I have a neighbor myself who left an, a new subdivision on the South Mountain, even though they had a bigger, newer house. Why? So they, their children could walk to school. This area um, of the Centre Mount owes a lot to generous legacy gifts. They have, the reason we have the lovely Bruce Park is that William Bruce left the property surrounding his home to the city for the purposes of a park. Apparently he was actually quite a guy. He was a businessman, an astronomer, and a teacher, and students were actually invited back to his place where he had a conserv an observatory and to study the stars. William Pym, as we have mentioned, left land to create this uh, special church, Olivet. And I've heard stories from the older um, gentleman who went to the school, or went to Olivet, and he said that the, the original older church had a, sort of a large gymnasium type room and they had lots of after school activities for the kids. And this was at a time when there were not rec centers and people didn't have disposable money for their kids' education, uh, recreational activities. And so this service was very vital. And why do I tell you about this? It's because I think it's important to remember and appreciate all that has been done for us. The Bruce family, the Pims, and many, many more families made significant legacy gifts to lay the foundation for the future residents of the Centre Mountain and to this neighbourhood in particular. We are the future that they were trying to help. In the foyer of Queensdale School is a work of art, even though it is mostly names. It is a hand-painted document prepared by A.J. Casson of the Group of Seven. And in calligraphy are the names of the students from the Brantale School and I'd like to quote from that piece. It says, these are the students who volunteered for active service in the Canadian Fighting Forces. Beside some of the names is a red star indicating that they didn't come home. The document is prepared in such a way that it tells you that people thought it would always be considered important. Brantdale School is gone now, and Queensdale now has the honour of looking after it. If you don't live in Hamilton, you might not realize that we have 18 waterfalls. Often people who aren't from Hamilton think of it as, I guess we still think of it as, as a lunchbox town or that we're polluted. But we also have this network of small schools throughout the city. They are not relics of a failed system and have proven themselves to be a vital connecting force within neighborhoods. And that is why I support the staff recommendation because it keeps schools strategically placed throughout the Central Mountain and I think that's really important. And if it matters from where I stand, it looks like the parents from this school will step up and do all that is required to make this school, to change this school from a JK to an eight. Are you gonna tell me I have a minute? <laughs> You're good. You're good, yes. One minute. <laughs> well, then I guess that should be it then. I had a funny story, but I won't do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we're going to take a short five-minute break and we'll reconvene uh, in a couple moments. Thank you. No, it's 
It's just starting to load up. So, was somebody making a presentation?
Thank you, Lynn. If everyone could please take their seats, we're going to get started in one short moment. Please take your seats. Heather has my number, okay? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Everyone is grabbing their seats. If we could please have L. Patton to the microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you very much as everyone's returning to their seats. Just a short uh, public service announcement. We did find a mint color cell phone in the small bathroom. If anyone is missing a cell phone, you could try to call yourself, but that won't work because I have your cell phone. So if anyone is missing it, come see me. Thank you. Okay, so we move to the next delegate, uh, number 14 on our list, which is L. Patton. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present this delegation in support of Queensdale School. Technology in the 21st century it provides a great opportunity to bring education into the classroom in new and exciting ways. So the following video, brief video we have, discusses that further as it relates to the Central Mountain Arc. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everyone. My name is Don Danko. I'm a college professor and I have a Master's of Science in Education with a specialty in teaching and learning. I have been an active participant in the Central Mountain Arc since September 2013 as a parent and a community member. As delegation night loomed closer, I struggled to choose a topic because, let's face it, there is so much we could discuss. Recently, I attended a board meeting where Dr. Malloy presented the vision for 21st century learning, and I found my inspiration. I also thought it would be fitting to bring this information to you in a blended format, as I am out of the country. Before we get into 21st century learning, I'd like to start with problem solving from a student perspective. The HWDSB has been developing a number of initiatives to help our students develop for the future. I would like to use solution fluency, as our students are expected to use in problem solving, and apply it to our accommodation review situation. Before I do that, let's have a look at what is meant by solution fluency. Solution fluency is the ability to define a problem, creatively generate solutions, try a solution, and then review the outcome and modify the plan. You must be willing to alter your path. So solution or problem solving fluency as I like to think of it, involves defining a problem, creatively generating solutions, trying a solution, reviewing outcomes, and modifying the plan. The key message was you must be willing to alter your path. So let's apply this to the arc for the Central Mountain area. The problem, very simply defined, is at HWDSB, we have schools with empty spaces and in need of expensive renovations. The ARC, the Accommodation Review Committee, was formed to creatively generate solutions. Unfortunately, they were limited in their creativity by a couple of things. These included the guiding principles. There were no priorities attached to the guiding principles and it was challenging to find a solution where every guiding principle applied. They were limited to the ARC geography and identified schools. They couldn't look just outside of our boundaries to see if there were schools that were over capacity where a boundary change might have simplified the solution. Or they couldn't look at programming at other schools within our boundaries. There were also misconceptions that may have stifled the creativity of the ARC. The revised staff option recognizes a number of things that would have been challenging for the accommodation review committee members to see. For one, it recognizes that one size does not fit all. As Dr. Malloy stated, you cannot use all of the guiding principles in every scenario. They are flexible. They have to be flexible unless you're dealing with a blank slate. 
The revised staff option also recognized the unique community values and public input that was collected over the several months of the ARC process. In addition, because of 21st century learning, we are learning at the HWDSB how to provide programs in new ways. Now, if we looked at what the students were expected to do for problem solving, they were to identify the problem, creatively generate solutions, and then try a solution, review outcomes, and modify the plan. Often what people will do is look back historically to see what worked and didn't work. But we have to remember in our case, historical data is pre-21st century learning. Let's look at what that means. In March of this year, the board unanimously approved the vision and direction for 21st century learning in the Hamilton-Wentworth District School Board. The new teaching and learning tools in 21st century learning provide flexibility in the who, what, when, where, and how of program offerings. Technological tools adopted by 21st century learning also allow the board to act in a responsive manner to meet student needs in a rapidly changing environment. And new tools change modes of collaboration between students and between teachers. Let's explore further how 21st century learning is relevant in the Central Mountain Accommodation Review. There are three key points I would like to discuss with respect to traditional ideas surrounding school size and optimal education. 21st century learning brings us flexibility in programming and delivery models that impact the optimal school size. It also provides adaptive tools to meet all student needs, which impacts optimal classroom structures and organization. 21st century learning also includes technological tools that improves collaboration practices between teachers. Let's look at flexibility. According to the HWDSB report on education for the 21st century, and I quote, Technology provides access to a number of authorities on different subjects, bringing into question the role of textbooks and how the role of teacher needs to evolve. Blended learning and utilization of technological resources in the classroom means that the board can be more flexible when designing optimal learning environments. With the new tools available, we don't need to follow the scientific management theory that suggests you need a subject specialist teacher teaching the same material successively. For example, where we would historically need teacher specialists provided for specific programming, we can bring the expert to the classroom remotely, just as I bring this delegation information to you tonight. Our teachers in the classroom can act as a guide for subsequent active learning, just as Dr. Malloy demonstrated in his 21st century learning presentation, which you can find on the HWDSB website. This means what would previously be a staffing and programming challenge in a small JK-8 school is now an opportunity for positive change that will better prepare today's students for the world of tomorrow. You can maximize the use of faculty experts across schools, and you are not tied to the traditional school structure. In fact, to maintain traditional school structures and program structures would be a missed opportunity to be a leader in education in the landscape today. In many schools, combined grade classes are necessary to maximize staffing efficiency and responsible spending of education dollars by filling classrooms. The HWDSB website provides advantages of combined grade classrooms. Moving forward, technology and new teaching strategies will further enhance how teachers deliver personalized education as they meet various student learning needs. It is important to recognize that at all levels of school, but particularly JK-8, relationships and a supportive school community are essential for optimizing learning and achievement. Again, the 21st century learning direction means we can take advantage of the strong community built in smaller JK-8 schools where everyone knows your name. Technology has changed the way we all communicate and collaborate. The idea that collaboration must happen face-to-face -face is no longer valid. One of the exciting aspects of the board embracing technological tools in 21st century learning is the opportunity for effective and efficient collaboration between teachers. Not only can they collaborate within a school, but across schools in a board, and even better, across the world. The need for multiple teachers per grade in a school has been made redundant by modern communication technologies. With 21st century learning, what didn't work in the past can and will work in the future in the education of our young people. 21st century learning means changing an old model of education to a new model of education that prepares students of today for the world of tomorrow. 
The new era of education adopted by the HWDSB is primed with opportunity for positive change. Recognizing three key things, flexibility in programming, adaptive tools for varied student needs, and vastly improved collaboration between teachers via technology is critical as decisions are being made that affect the future of students and communities. Remember, in order to change an old model of education, you must be willing to alter your path. Please support a creative, responsive solution for the Central Mountain Arc. Back to you, Lynn. Okay, so um, you can see that information and expertise can be brought into the classroom using technology, and certainly for small children, there's the interactive and animated tools to enhance student engagement. One minute. And so I would like to just say thank you for your time and consideration with this difficult decision. Thank you, and before you, before you leave, sorry, just to clarify for trustees, the, the voice, which was fantastic, by the way, um, who was that? So we just know. Don, the, Dan Don Danko. Don Danko, perfect. All right, thank you. Now, now, oh, and a question of clarification. Trustee Johnstone. Um, I noticed that Don wasn't in the audience tonight. He had to be out of the country, so at the last minute, so. Okay, um, I'm just wondering, is that presentation online? Is it on YouTube or? Uh, we can certainly post it to uh, where. It is. It is. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, and then just to clarify for trustees, I don't think everyone heard the name Don Danko. D A N K O. Sorry, sorry, Trustee Glauser, the question? I was just saying, you know, for trustee, uh, yeah, we can discuss it afterwards on a way to get the presentation, whether it's the material or the full presentation to all trustees. Fantastic. Okay, now round of applause. <laughs> Next, we have Reverend M. Barton. Good evening. Thanks for letting me have a few minutes. I, I certainly come as an outsider. I've been in Hamilton for two years, and I'm the, the minister at All Event United Church for the last two and a half years. Uh, I don't know how you follow a disembodied voice, but uh, I agree. <laughs> I, I think to summarize what, what that was partially about was that uh, expediency uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, excellency. And I think what's been happening, what I've heard, uh, there seems to be unanimity around one, one key thing, and that this entire process, which has pitted communities against each other, uh, is, in the words of uh, Councillor uh, McHattie, obscene. And if nothing else, with regards to this process, if nothing else happens, I would urge uh, all of you, good people, to send a very strongly worded letter to, uh, to the province saying that this is not acceptable to the good people of Hamilton. Um, it's just not right. Uh, you people have, uh, it's, uh, it, it, I don't know what they're doing, but anyway. I'm here as the Minister of Olivet United Church to say that I am extremely proud and as, as an outsider, uh, just observing this community of Queensdale and around Queensdale and, and uh, no disrespect to the other communities at all because I, I, don't, I don't live or work, work there, but um, this is working. Whatever we have uh, at Queensdale, it's working. It's working so well. Uh, our church, our, our faith community, uh, we, we have a mutuality of, of caring with uh, the Queensdale families uh, and children. We offer PA day camps uh, that's affordable. It's $5 for every PA day. It's five bucks for the whole day. And we've got 25 kids from the school coming out. We offer uh, summer day camp programs, again, for the, for the neighborhood. Our purpose as a, as a faith community is to, uh, we're blessed in order to bless. And so um, what's happening around, in and around the school, it goes far beyond just what happens in the school. Uh, we have a, a wonderful relationship that we're continuing to, to, uh, to grow and nurture. There's a great deal of respect. And so um, any changes to that certainly would, be, uh, would cause a great deal of, of, of confusion and um, would be hurtful to, to uh, our, our, our community. And, and I see the families in my, in my church up there, and, and I'm so proud of them for their dedication and their, and their commitment to to nurturing their, their community. 
So as I say, we have a great relationship with our neighbors at Queensdale, and this trust is what uh, uh, families want. They want to trust their teachers, they want to trust their school, they want to trust their school board, they want to trust their churches, and, and this is what's happening here in and around Queensdale. And, and when I, kids call out to me when I'm going to the park with my dog, I, I see them and they'll say, hey, Mike. It's like, hi, because they've come to my day camp, you know, and, and uh, it's really exciting to see that happening and it's, it's a wonderful thing. So I just want to say in closing that the Queensdale community is very special to, uh, to Olivet. Uh, we are, we are uh, we're not separate. We're this wonderful, organic, mutually loving and, and caring community that is thriving. And uh, the children are thriving. I, I uh, spoke to Maria Carboni, the, uh, the principal, a while back, and, and uh, it was an incredible uh, opportunity to get to know one another and to share stories. And, and uh, so we, we want to say that uh, all of that is going to continue to uh, love and care for our neighbors. That's why we're there. And, uh, and that we, uh, we're grateful for uh, the, the, the school, the teachers, uh, and certainly the families there. And so thank you so much for the few minutes. Next to N. Kinneberg. Good evening, uh, everybody. My name is Nathan Kinneber. I'm a healthcare professional, and I work, uh, or I live, up in the area around the uh, Queensdale School. I moved my family into the Queensdale area for the school, for its proximity to healthcare locate or healthcare sites, as well as its uh, opportunity for learning and, or learning facilities in the area. I've, uh, I'd like to show a video that looks a little more in depth at Queensdale's unique location to a variety of major employers in the Hamilton area. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Paul Danko. I'm a professional engineer and the senior project manager at LS Engineering, Inc. Along with that, I am also the owner of Blur Media, which is a commercial photography and video production company. And of course, I'm also the parent of two Queensdale students. So before I get started with my presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to recognize the hard work and thought that the board staff has put into the Central Mountain Arc option that's currently on the table. $2.6 million has been invested in Queensdale in the last 10 years. So the potential of that investment is maximized by keeping the school open. So all around, this is a win-win-win scenario. Uh, it's a win for students, it's a win for the community, and it's also a win for the board. I think it's actually really important to note how excited our entire community really is about the prospect of Queensdale becoming a 300 student kindergarten to grade eight school. You know, we really couldn't have asked for a better conclusion to the ARC, and our entire community is very, very, very excited about the future for our school and for our community. Now, I know that there is some concern about the feasibility of a 300-student K-8 school, and regardless if you look at studies that say larger schools are better or smaller schools are better, the fact is that parents who live in urban, walkable communities want to send their kids to small, walkable community schools, especially in elementary school. And, you know, really, that's why we all moved to this community in the first place. It was because of Queensdale School. So in that respect, a 300 student K-8 elementary school is the perfect fit for the Queensdale community, and we could not be happier with the recommendation that staff has proposed as your best course of action. However, what I really want to present to you tonight is about enrollment. We all know that the HWDSB staff uh, base their school enrollment projections on yields per household. So that's to say that if you have X number of houses in a community, you'll end up with Y number of students at a particular school. We also know that parents that live in older established communities often argue that as older residents move out, newer, younger families move in. 
And we certainly see that anecdotally in our community. I mean, just in the past year, we've had three new families move onto our street. But traditionally, that argument has not held much weight because in the past, we haven't really seen a statistically significant bump in enrollment uh, due to community turnover. You know, although I grew up uh, at Upper Ottawa and Fennel, and I think Highview is a perfect example of a school that was closed because of low enrollment, and now it's a thriving JK to 8 school. And really, I think that's a perfect example of what the future of Queensdale will look like. The point I want to make is that enrollment projections are based on statistical yields and historic trends that don't take into account externalities that are community specific. So what I'd like to present to you is what I think is a huge externality that will really have a profound impact on the 21st century enrollment at Queensdale School. Because the, the current thinking is that the HWDSB prefers schools in growth areas. And traditionally, growth areas have meant Ancaster, Binbrook, and south of the link. But what I want to show you is how Queensdale School um, is actually at the heart of Hamilton's 21st century economy. First, let's look at some statistics. In the past, manufacturing and the steel industry were the core of Hamilton's economy. In 1996, healthcare employed 18% of the total workforce in Hamilton, education employed 11%, and construction was at 9%. By 2006, 10 years later, healthcare employment had jumped by 31%, education employment by 57%, and construction employment by 78%. Today, Hamilton Health Sciences is the largest employer in Hamilton with nearly 10,000 employees. Most demographics experts agree that healthcare, education, and technology are expected to lead Hamilton's new economy into the 21st century. So now the question is, how does that fundamental economic shift relate to enrollment at Queensdale School? To get started, let's look at a map. Because what you'll notice is that the Queensdale community is actually completely surrounded by the cornerstones of Hamilton's 21st century economy. Uh, most of them have seen a massive reinvestment in the very near past, or they're currently undergoing a huge redevelopment, and they're all within easy walking distance. If we start at Queensdale School, to the east, we have Hamilton Health Sciences Jurovinsky Hospital, and also Hamilton Health Sciences Jurovinsky Cancer Center. The Jurovinsky Cancer Center offers one of the largest cancer treatment services in Ontario. Next door, we have Jurovinsky Hospital, which was just renovated in 2012 with a 400,000 square foot expansion. The walking distance from Queensdale School to either building is about two and a half kilometers and it takes around half an hour. To the west of Queensdale, we have Mohawk College and St. Joseph's Healthcare West 5th Campus. Both are major regional employers and both recently received a massive redevelopment. The distance is one and a half kilometers and takes less than 20 minutes to walk. South of the Queensdale neighborhood, we have the HWDSB Education Center, another major regional employer. At a distance of three kilometers, the walk takes about half an hour to 45 minutes, or it's a very quick bike ride. And finally, north of the Queensdale neighborhood, we have St. Joseph's Hospital and all of downtown Hamilton. The distance is about a kilometer and a half and it takes less than 20 minutes to walk. It might not be that apparent that St. Joseph's Hospital and the employment centers in downtown Hamilton are that close and simple of a walk from the Queensdale neighborhood. So to prove just how easy it is to walk, this is my wife Dawn walking to St. Joseph's Hospital to give birth to our first child, Sadie. And in case you think that is a fluke, here she is again walking to St. Joseph's Hospital while in labor to give birth to our son, Isaac. To close, I'd like to leave you with five points. First, Queensdale School is at the heart of Hamilton's 21st century cornerstone employers. Second, 
future growth areas are not continuing suburban expansion. Young professionals want to live in an urban walkable community with a local walkable elementary school at its center. Three, the Queensdale community is already undergoing a massive urban renewal with surrounding employers already leading the way. Fourth, a 300 student K-8 walkable community school is exactly the type of school that young modern parents want to send their kids to and they will specifically move to communities that offer them what they want. Finally, to take advantage of these fundamental changes in societal attitudes and future economic growth trends, the HWDSB needs to act now to stay ahead of competition for enrollment. You can do that right now by voting to accept the revised staff option for the Central Mountain Arc and make Queensdale a 300 student K-8 elementary school. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my views tonight. I look forward to your decision. One minute. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to us and uh, for uh, the time that you've taken and your consideration of, of the different options that you have. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have L. Friesen. Friesen? Oh no, my apologies. Let, let me try this again. Number 17, G. Simpson. Ah, there, there you go. <laughs> Just making sure everyone was paying attention. Excuse me while I uh, kind of enjoy the moment. It's the first time here. And quite nice. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Glenn Simpson. I moved to the Central Mountain in the spring of 1943. I have never left. To say that I am familiar with the Central Mountain would be an understatement. On March the 21st, I sent an email to all trustees that dealt with the school closures. The email was very critical and specifically took pot shots at the provincial maladroit money handlers, the antiquated funding formula, the Hamilton board, and last but not least, the process. In hindsight, I regret that my comments were so aggressively negative and non-productive as I offered up no solutions nor suggestions dealing with these four items. And what precipitated this change? It was a simple phone call. Within an hour of sending that March 21st email, I received a phone call from trustee Ms. Johnstone. She was on her lunch, and we had a nice 30-minute chat. Ms. Johnstone's focus was the school closure process. She asked me for my thoughts on how the process could be improved. I replied that I did not consider myself qualified. I explained that my role was of a minor nature. I provided Ms. Johnstone with a name from the Queensdale Core Group. Later, Ms. Johnstone spoke with this person. Subsequently, I have given the process a great deal of thought. Can it be improved? Of course. Everything since the beginning of time has been improved upon. If it were not so, we would be holding this meeting in a large cave under the escarpment. For the required improvements to the process, I leave to others, my friends. I'm here to speak of the existing process, how it is, not how it could be. The process starts in Toronto. 
winds its way along the QEW to the Hamilton board, is moved along to include the ARC volunteers, and then the process takes a giant leap to embrace the inner thoughts and voices of the public. The board and the ARC listened and independently took the public input back to their desk where they did the serious homework and completed their assignment. The common thread throughout the process is people, good, reasonable, and well-intentioned people, people from all walks of life, people making every effort to work within the parameters of the process. It is this existing process that has resulted in the three options that are now before the trustees, two by the ARC and one by the board. It is my assessment that the ARC deserves to be recognized and commended for their time and effort spent resulting in excellent thought out options. However, I always watch out for their hell, however, now I've lost my place. However, it is my opinion that the ARC was at a disadvantage and perhaps reluctant to swing for the fences. One minute. And therefore, elected to play it safe by hitting out a single and a double. No shame in that. As for the board, they are the big players with the big bats and well positioned and prepared to go for the long ball. And I see their option as a out of the park home run and therefore has my support. Is the process half empty or half full? Is the process broken or does it just need mending? I find it awkward to be overly critical of a process that for me has gone my way. It is much like criticizing the 649 lottery after winning the big one. A good process is simply a forum for presenting, explaining, listening, and promoting the exchange of ideas for the greater good, while allowing for a degree of compromise. The involvement of people has brought us here this evening, and collectively it will be the people who will bring about an improved process to the delicate matter of school closures. Please remember, that you are not just an end user of the process, you are also part of the process. In closing, may I remind you that the Central Mountain Closure process is not over. Remaining is the June 9th trustee vote, followed by the June 16th ratification. There is no such thing as a sure thing. To paraphrase Yogi Berra, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till the trustees vote. Please stay involved. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to share with you my thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have M. Pachet. Yeah, it's plug and play, so just put the, the memory stick in there. Or if there's one in there, pull it out. Yeah. By the way, someone may have lost their memory stick. Oh no, we have found the phone, by the way. I, I had to bring my resident tech expert. Hi, my name is Mike Patchett, and uh, my wife Robin, who prefers to stay out of the limelight. Um, um, let me get that mic to my notes here. Uh, Robin and I both have lived in the Central Mountain area our entire life. Uh -oh. um, our entire life. Um, 
when we decided to raise a family, we didn't know if we wanted two, three, eight kids. Um, we didn't know if we preferred boys or girls. Maybe we'd have a couple of each. Um, but one thing we did know is we wanted our kids to attend Queensdale. Because um, we knew Queensdale was something special. Um, my mom was a teacher at Queensdale for many years. In fact, it was, my, my wife attended Queensdale and it was one month after we found out Robin was pregnant with our first Jordan on the left um, that uh, we sold our house and moved to another home in the Queensdale catchment area. Um, we have two girls, Jordan and Kyla, age six and four, and they're both attending Queensdale now. The first time I visited Queensdale um, was about 28 years ago. I guess I was about age seven. My mom, who spoke earlier, uh, was a teacher librarian in the school. And I have many fond memories of our end of summer routine that mom and I had. I would come in for the last few days of my summer vacation and help mom putting up posters in the library, um, organizing the AV room, all the tape decks and record players and beta VCRs, <laughs> and just general redecorating for the year to keep things spiced up for the students every year. And uh, it really got me excited for back to school time. Um, my wife, who attended Queensdale for elementary school, um, was there ironically the same time my mom was. Um, I, however, didn't meet her till I think it was grade 10 photography class at Hill Park. Uh, and on a funny side note, it's very strange when you bring a new girlfriend home to meet mom and dad and your mom knows no more about her than you do. <laughs> it had been a few years um, since I had been in to see Queensdale uh, when we en enrolled Jordan, our oldest, uh, for kindergarten. I couldn't believe how great the school looked when I came in. Um, there had been a number of renos over the years, and uh, when we started the ARC process, um, I was quite shocked uh, to learn that the facility condition index had Queensdale rated as only fair condition. Um, I'm a carpenter by trade, 20 years in the trade, and I'm a little OCD, I tend to notice things, and I couldn't figure out where anything in Queensdale was only fair. Um, so I'd like to take a quick minute uh, to take all of you here on a quick virtual tour of Queensdale School. So this is our current facility condition. I'm not gonna go, to go greatly into any stats or anything, I just wanna show you some photos. So here's the front of the school, our beautiful treed lot. Many times we spend over there, even on, on uh, weekends with the kids, whether it's walking the dog or out just looking at nature. Uh, approaching the school, you can see our brand new doors, and I believe it was Mr. Bear had touched upon some possibly uh, incorrect data during the ARC processes. This is one thing that kind of caught my eye. There was a few things about Queensdale in particular that didn't add up. Um, on our urgent renewal list is, I don't know the exact number, forty or fifty thousand dollars to replace exterior doors. Every single door in the school has been replaced. Um, anyways, continuing on in, into the school, we have a, a typical hallway. We have the original uh, terrazzo floors, sparkling clean. Um, we've had all the ceilings and lighting replaced. Here's a, a typical classroom, nice and bright and shiny. Uh, Mom's library, not quite how I remembered it because the murals weren't there when I was decorating, but um, it's uh, a nice cozy place for the kids to learn. Uh, down the hallway a little further, uh, another couple classrooms here. Uh, new air conditioning and uh, air handler unit. This one's in the uh, computer lab particularly, but every room in the school, every classroom is air conditioned. Another classroom photo here. Uh, all new windows in the school as well. And down to the dark and dingy basement boiler room. Oh, okay, maybe not so dark and dingy. <laughs> Actually, we have a brand new heating and air conditioning system that was put in in 2006. All new boilers. They're actually all computer controlled. This is the, uh, the computer control system, which apparently can be controlled remotely from another location. A new electrical service, new branch wiring, washrooms all upgraded. 
All, as I said, all the exterior doors replaced. I didn't bother to bring pictures of every single one, but just a few. Um, our kindergarten class, which uh, as far as I understand is full FDK ready, already has the washroom, the sinks, the fountain, the whole nine yards, and the separate entrance for the kindergarten students. And our gymnasium, which has had a whole new coat of paint, all new lights, new sound system put in. And then back out towards the front of the school, as I said, our original terrazzo floor, which was another thing on our uh, urgent renewal needs, was uh, a very significant sum of money, I can't recall what, um, for replacing the main school floor finishes. But as you can see, they're, they're sparkling as they were in 1948. And out to the front of the school to have a look at all the beautiful flowers that the uh, parents came by and planted for us. And there we have our Queenstill School. Um, I know several of the trustees have had a chance to come by and take a tour of the school, and I urge the rest of you to have a look. And uh, it's been uh, a wonderful experience in the 28 years that I've been uh, around Queensdale, and I'm hoping that uh, we can look forward to having Queensdale available for generations to come. Thanks. Thank you very much, and thanks to your technical assistant as well. Next, we have who I scared earlier by almost calling you early is uh, L. Friesen. Friesen. Can we create a hand? No. And I don't mind starting while you finish up. I actually think the rev on the next person's name, is that actually supposed to be my rev or are we just back to back? Yeah. I'm actually uh, Reverend Leanne Friesen um, as opposed to the, the next uh, person being the rev. And I'm the minister at, uh, <laughs> I thought that's a strange coincidence. Um, I'm actually the minister at Mount Hamilton Baptist Church, which is right at the center of this ARC community. And in fact, uh, with 50 children in primary and elementary age regularly attending our church. We have children that attend or have attended every school in our ARC and currently most attend Eastmount or Armstrong or Queensdale where my two children also attend. Now I know that the truth is we've heard lots of wonderful stories about uh, our school that we know that every school could get up and tell equally wonderful stories. Everyone loves their schools. And I truly believe that we are a community of great schools. I hear the stories and I hear the children talking from other schools and I know we have lots of great schools in our area. My first option of course would be that if you can find a way to keep every school open, that is what I would like you to do. Thank you, that would be excellent. But we can't do that, we know maybe. Um, I think that that would have been the ARC's first choice as well. So our second choice, of course, would be that if you can find an option to keep as many schools open as possible, that would be our desire. Um, as a minister, one of the things that I frequently do are weddings, and I do make our couples take premarital classes. And my favorite class is when we talk about communication. And in that class, I teach them how to do active listening. Perhaps some of you have been trained in active listening. If not, I'll explain it a little bit now. It's very helpful. In active listening, when someone speaks, you simply feed back to them what you've heard them say. And so if the wife were, were for example, to say to her husband, I am very upset that you put your dirty towel on the floor this morning and that makes you feel like you disrespect me, the husband would not say, well, the reason I dropped the towel is because I was really busy or I didn't have time or what have you. If he was actively listening, he would say, what I hear you saying is, you are upset that I have left the towel on the floor and you feel I disrespect you. It can sound a little silly, but what you quickly realize when couples practice this activity is how much they value being heard. What I hear you saying is, and simply feeding back what they've heard from their partner. Um, I had the privilege of serving on the ARC, and so I was at all the public meetings and heard a large amount of input. And one of the things that I'm grateful for as I'm here tonight is that I do believe that the board heard many of the concerns of our community. One of the big concerns that came up was the desire to keep open as many schools as possible. We were concerned that the north side of the mountain was losing all but one of its schools, and after losing Hill Park, we were being decimated. The board's original option closed Eastmount, Queensdale, and Linden Park. 
And so when we saw that the board took into account many of these concerns with their options, and now it is just two communities that will lose a community school, acknowledging that there is a school, uh, Cardinal, uh, slated to close, so still three, but with their elementary school on site, there is still a community school in that community. We saw, I see this as a plus. I see this as the board having heard the community. And so I guess what I would say today is that I will hope you will hear what we are saying. We are not asking you to come up with something new. We know that your task is arduous. We would simply like you to continue to listen as the board has. And so what you hear us saying is we want the least amount of schools closed as possible. Thank you. Next, we have not a reverend. L. Maru. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, I was first hoping that she wasn't going to correct that. Maybe my story would carry a little bit more weight, but <laughs> she did. <laughs> Um, good evening, uh, my name is Leah LaRiviere. I do have a son that attends the JK program at Linden Park currently, um, starting this year, and my daughter will be attending in 2015. I've been an East 16th resident for nine years, purchasing my first home in this area. I thought it was just gonna be a starter home for myself. My husband Jason and I have quickly realized that um, we're going to stay there for quite some time, as long as there's schools in the area. We also understand, as a taxpayer and a resident, that keeping schools open that are empty is not a logical possibility for our community. This community has generated a long-standing home for a lot of owners in the area, and they have really strong roots in our community. I speak today as a concerned mother and taxpayer when the process first started, my faith and trust in this process was immediately decanted at the first public meeting when errors in the data immediately presented itself. There were overall deer in the headlights looks from the speakers at the meeting when concerned parents had really strong questions that they asked the speakers and they could not answer. For me, that put lack of trust in the process simply because the questions that we were asking could not be answered immediately. After a few minutes, they quickly responded with, we'll get back to you at the next meeting and the data that's, that has the errors will be corrected. To me, when you're presenting data with this magnitude in the city and a community that has passion for their children and it's their most passionate thing in life, you better come to the table with accurate, truthful, and important information for these parents and have answers ready for them when they're asked. In building the trust for the community and generating faith, if this is important to you as a board, I please urge you to think about the decisions that you're about to make for each community. With Linden Park, it's the heart of the community. That block will have no school to it. I brought with me today an article that was presented in the Mountain News about traffic in the area of Upper Wentworth and Mohawk. And they tested on October 16th from 11 a.m. to 12 in the afternoon, so one hour, 1,500 cars going northbound on Upper Wentworth and Mohawk. 17 of them blew that red light without even hitting their brakes. To me, that is scary when we're asking our kids to cross streets. If they close Linden Park, they'll either have to go to Franklin Road or to Cardinal Heights, which you're asking them to cross four lane major streets on both sides without considering increasing crossing guards and or putting these children on buses where the traffic, they're gonna be spending more time in this traffic hours of the day. To me, that's alarming and I hope studies like this are shown and taken into consideration when making your decisions of having these children walk or potentially drive further distances in their community. I challenge you all to think clearly about the impact your decisions are gonna be making. 
I urge you to make decisions today that restore the faith of our community in the Linden Park area and the community in the ARC process. The one that you lay, make a decision that when you lay your head down at night that you're going to be able to fall asleep and not worry about the decision that you made. As for the ARC process, I really hope in the future ARCs that you do hold, that the data that you collect is accurate and it's in from the right time frame that you're looking for, and that the decisions that you make of help most of the communities in the area and not just single communities. Linden Park staying open clearly is the right choice and I hope you make the right decision at the right time for the right reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next we have S. Shields. Brought a couple things with you. You need a hand? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not offering, just... <laughs> Good evening. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you this evening. The ARC process is a demanding one. When done well, it requires an enormous commitment from the ARC committee, parents, board staff, teachers, community members, and you, the trustees. The process is difficult, and I believe it should be. The informed decision to close a school and irrevocably change a community and the future of its children's education should be difficult. The school closure process is polarizing communities across our province. Many people question the wisdom of a ministry policy that affords individual school boards so much autonomy in school closure decisions. A year ago, I might have been one of those people. A year ago, I had no idea how education was funded in this province. A year ago, I had never heard of the long-term facilities master plan. A year ago, I really only had a vague idea of what a trustee does. A year ago, I hadn't been through an ARC. I've been an engaged parent and community member in the Central Mountain ARC. I attended most of the working group meetings and actively participated in the public meetings. I've read thesis statements about school closures, studied ministry and board policies, reviewed documents, and researched a debating school size and great organizations. I've examined the data for all current and archived HWDSB elementary ARCs. You might think this indicates I have a little too much time on my hands, but I wanted to be informed, and I know a lot more than I did a year ago. The ARC process isn't perfect. It's divisive by nature, and it does pit one community against another. It has a demanding timeline, and it asks our individuals to put aside their, their preferences for their own school and consider the needs of an entire planning area. There's no question there are ways the process can be improved, but the intentions behind it are what I think is important. And ARCs were designed in the, with the idea that through public consultation, school closure decisions are made in accordance with each community's individual needs. The four HWDSB elementary ARCs this year had 115 members voting in advisory. Over public meetings totaling 39 hours and 43 minutes, and working group meetings totaling 90 hours and 41 minutes, these 115 people took feedback from 1,013 public attendees. They received 98 recorded letters and correspondence, and they considered 51 options for four, the 5,490 students in these 22 schools. All of this to inform their recommendations to the director submitted a few months ago. The board's next task was to consider their original recommendation in light of this public feedback and submit in the form of a director's report a final recommendation to you, the trustees. An additional 3,375 pages in appendix documents were also submitted for your review and consideration, along with the art committee report. 3,375 pages. It's a lot to review, and I'm not going to ask any of you what page number you're on, but to put that many pages in perspective, I brought with me the materials I accumulated, accumulated from the beginning of the process. Meeting minutes, school information profiles, articles, policies, letters, costume charts, student distribution maps. It's, it's my own little arc archive. It contains 1,578 pages. So if you were thinking about printing uh, your appendix to the ARCs, I would recommend doing it double-sided, which would make it 1,688 pages. So my box is pretty close, actually. Um, 
In fairness, I have some duplicate copies in there because you might be out with a friend having coffee and you never know when you might need an extra copy of the long-term facility master plan. <laughs> I, I like to be prepared. In the six weeks since the reports were submitted, you've heard from 94 delegations and had 85 letters of publicly posted correspondence. I can't begin to guess how many private emails and letters each of you have individually received. All of this so you can decide, did the process work? Was the voice of the public heard? And has the board addressed the unique needs of each of these communities? As a resident of the Central Mountain, I wish we could keep all eight of our walkable community schools. I particularly regret the recommended closure of Linden Park and the loss of a second school for that community. I am realistic enough to have realized, however, we can't fill or maintain all of our schools. The location of Queensdale is one of the reasons my husband and I chose our home. Our children can attend a school they safely walk to, where their teachers learn and address their unique needs, and they have a true sense of community and better access to extracurricular activities in a smaller school format. I've long wished Queensdale would be JK to 8. Not just selfishly, because it'd be nice to have all my kids under one school roof for a couple of years, but also to, so our students could avoid the transition in grades 7 and 8 to an established uh, JK to 8 school. The Central Mountain community was not apathetic about this process. They were engaged. 61% of the publicly posted correspondence on the board website came from our communities. And we had the highest recorded public attendance at meetings, 572. The Central Mountain community didn't resist this change. They offered alternative solutions, 35 of them, as a matter of fact, with varied grade organizations and boundary shifts to amalgamate different combinations of schools and find the right solution for our communities. The Central Mountain community is informed. We asked questions and submitted Freedom of Information Act requests. We challenged the data, and I admit we found ourselves at odds with the board on more than one occasion. Public feedback records our priorities as walkability, community balance, student safety, fewer transitions, considerations of specialized programs, and students with specialized learning needs, minimal division of current student bodies, and full utilization of the facilities we already have, rather than closing just enough schools to get a big new one. These were our guiding principles. I don't presume to suggest that they work for every community, but it's what the Central Mountain wanted for ours. And in our case, the board was listening. They've endeavored to find a balance where board goals don't have to compromise community values. The revised board recommendation has improved utilization from 68 to 92% in 2022. Renewal needs have been reduced by 12.8 million over those 10 years, and the capital requirements at 6.3 million are lower than either East Hamilton or West Flamborough because they don't rep recommend a new build. For the Central Mountain, the board did not simply endorse an ARC option. They further responded to public feedback by giving all of our students equitable access to a JK-8 school. For all of these reasons, I support the revised board recommendation for the Central Mountain. I confess I'm a bit of a numbers person and I know I hide it well, but <laughs> my husband enjoys a good hockey game and I enjoy a well-designed spreadsheet. Uh, throughout the art process, I've tracked and charted and analyzed renewal costs, ministry benchmarks, enrollment data, EQAO results, utilization rates, transportation costs, all for multiple options. I pretty easily deal with data, things that can be quantified, measured, and calculated. But what I've learned is that you cannot deal with school closures by the numbers alone. How do you quantify the value of a school to its community, large or small, urban or rural urban adjacent? How do you measure a quality teaching and learning environment? How do you calculate the student impacts of a closure, a grade reorganization, or a boundary shift? What is the value of these things? I wish it was something I could put on a spreadsheet. With the last delegation tonight, 22 schools have been given the opportunity to ensure their voice has been heard. Now you begin the hardest work of this entire art process as you weigh the needs of these diverse and different communities and decide, did the board get it right? Is the option they presented truly the best one to blend community needs, board goals, funding constraints, the long-term facility plan master pr guiding principles, and above all, the best interests of the students? Since Trustee White hasn't given me my one-minute warning yet, and I've attended all the delegation nights, I hope consideration can be given in future ARCs to including more than two schools. When dealing with two schools, like in West Landbrook, the options are just too limited and the outcome may seem like a foregone conclusion to that community. I hope you keep Mill Grove School open to continue the excellence in education they've achieved for their geographically distant yet close-knit community. 
That delegation night actually made me want to move to Millgrove a little bit. <laughs> And I hope you can find a solution for East Hamilton that doesn't involve the closure of more than half of their schools. It just feels like too big a loss for a single area. And I hope you consider everything you've heard tonight from the Central Mountain. In closing, I want to thank committee members from all of the ARCs for their commitment and diligence throughout this difficult process. And thank you, the trustees, for your attention, your time, and your continued dedication to the students of Hamilton. Thank you and good night. Thank you very much. Uh, do trustees have any data questions at all? <laughs> we have some answers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next we have M. Mace. Uh, good evening, trustees, Dr. Malloy board staff, ladies and gentlemen, and children. It's good to see you all here. It's been quite the journey, hasn't it? Well, last summer, many of us in the Central Mountain area were beginning to find out about ARC and what it might mean for our school communities. We had read and heard about previous ARCs, of course, but one can never be sure about the accuracy of all stories in the media. We knew we had to be involved active participants in the process that was to help shape the future of our school, our community, our city, the place we call home. We attended the first public meeting in October. We listened, we voiced some opinions, and we learned about the path ahead. And so it began, a real voyage of discovery. We discovered what a huge commitment the volunteer members of the ARC were making in agreeing to be part of the process. We discovered how many hours the trustees devote to the decisions affecting our children's future. We discovered that the board, true to its word and faithful to the ARC process, would indeed have an open ear to the views of the concerned communities. And in the public meetings, in the letters to the editors, in the school playground, at community meetings, at board meetings, at ARG meetings, and in our living rooms, in the early hours of the morning, with candles burning low and voices raspy from hours of discussion, we discovered the real meaning of a local community with a thriving school at its heart. But more than that, we felt emotion, passion, and above all, a desire to be actively involved in the process that would guide our children's future. HWDSB understood the emotion and the passion as it worked hand in hand with the ARC, embracing the public voice and valuing the input of the local community. The heart of this process is community consultation. The consequence of this ARC, unfortunately, means some school communities will be negatively affected. Our school community core working groups spent long hours poring over options that would keep as many schools open as possible, and looked at scenarios both in and outside of the box, as did the Central Mountain Arc, as it narrowed down over 30 options to its final two choices. I believe the revised staff recommendation takes into account the efforts that have been made and the opinions that have been voiced. The board recommendation is aligned with the terms of reference and I fully endorse it. I made a short video that I would like to share showing stages of this journey and why I recommend the self option. I forgot to introduce myself properly at the start. My name is Matthew Mace. I'm actually an employee with uh, Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. I'm a teacher and I have two sons who attend Queen Star School. Welcome. If you just bear with me while I get this going, thanks. Tech support, anybody? Or is there a mouse? Sorry.
My apologies for that. Just had to do about the numbers.
One minute. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak on behalf of the Queensdale community. And I'd also like to thank everyone actually who's come out and is stuck with the process. We're close to the end, but not quite there. And as I say, I recommend voting for the revised staff option. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. A uh, number of confusing emotions right now. <laughs> Next, we have Kay Ash Ashworth. Kay Ashworth. And for a third time, Kay Ashworth. Seeing none, we will move forward. Next speaker is Kay Long. Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Long. I'm here in support of our recommendation one and keeping Linden Park School open. My son Carter's in grade four at Linden Park. I think your microphone is away. Or I think you? it's my height is away. <laughs> okay, Brennan, I will start again. Out. Can you hear me now? No, okay. My name is Kathy Long. I'm here in support of ARC recommendation one and keeping Linden Park School open. My son Carter is in grade four at Linden Park and has gone there since JK. I am the co-chair of Linden Park's parent council and I've lived around the corner from Linden Park for over 18 years. I served on this art committee and attended every working and public meeting. I am in support of the art recommendation one which keeps Linden Park school open and has it becoming a K to eight school. Recommendation one has the most renewal savings and the least amount of funding needed by the board if funding for a new school can be obtained from the province. It also allows for a backup plan if a new school is not funded with comparable savings to the other two recommendations. There are many reasons to keep Linden Park open. It's the most centrally located school in this arc, making it easily accessible for any other school's population to join us. Linden Park is located on over five acres of land and adjacent to a vast green city space, including multiple soccer fields, play structures, and city rec center. It is a very vibrant area in the community with peoples of all ages using this space. Having all this green space around Linden Park allows its students more than enough room for athletic team practices, fundraising walkathons, and outside gym time. It also provides Linden Park students easy access to the use of the rec center for swim team practices, grade three swim to survive program, swimming programs for special education students, and after school programs that are offered at the rec center. Linden Park has provided a safe and nurturing environment for all our students, including our special education students. With already having Hill Park School closed, it would be a mistake for the board to lose the use of this wonderful area. The parents of Linden Park have respected this art process. They have had a healthy attendance at all the art public meetings and provided strong feedback. I feel the purpose of the art committee was to reflect the voice of the community. I encourage you to read through the feedback from all four of the public meetings. The art recommendation two and the staff recommendation both fail to address the strong Linden Park opinions that were expressed at the public meetings. I have been told by many people that Linden Park will close because it's already been decided upon. I have to trust that the fate of our school or any school in this arc has not been made yet given the number of hours the parent volunteers, school staff volunteers, principal, board members, and trustees have put into this review. I'm asking you to respect Linden Park School students, staff, and community by not simply dismissing our school and support our recommendation one. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Next, we have S. Uh, McNichol. And just to check the audience while we're waiting here, is C. Ashworth? Yes? Oh, we do have a C. Ashworth. Good. So, one more to go.
Hi, my name is Shauna Pnickel, and I'm, a, I, I'm an employer of Mohawk College, but more importantly, I have two children that attend Queensdale School. Not only do my kids attend Queensdale, but I am the chair of parent council and I volunteer as much as I can as being a part of a community school isn't just for my kids, it is for all of us who have embraced the concept of what a community school really means. As I am not a great public speaker, I have chosen to show you my thoughts and images. Please sit back for the next three and a half minutes and embrace what we like to call the pride of Queensdale School. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, least we welcome C. Ashworth. Welcome. Yeah, hello, my name's Carrie. I'm a parent of two boys at East Mount Park. Um, obviously, I would love for East Mount Park to stay open, but I see that the um, current revised staff recommendation still has East Mount Park closing, so I thought the next best thing would be for me to come up with a viable second best option that I would be happy with as a parent of East Mount. So I would like to propose um, a change to the current revised staff recommendation for the Central Mountain. I want to see East, Mark, uh, East Mount Park students attend Franklin Road instead of GL Armstrong and GL Armstrong closed. 
Um, there's really just some simple reasons for this, and that is that Franklin Road has more green space, um, which means more room for the children at recess and after school, higher levels of activity, and more uh, room for outdoor sports. Uh, Franklin Road also isn't located on a high traffic street, and there's room on the property for um, necessary renovations. Um, so the projected student counts based on the data that was on the H the website um, for 2015 was 326 for East Mount when the full day kindergarten came in and 418 for Franklin Road. So this would equal roughly a 2016 if the two schools were to merge, if East Mount merged with Franklin Road, um, about 744 and that's not including the Linden Park merging with them. Um, so I'd like to see Armstrong closed um, instead of East Mount because it's lo located on Concession Street where the volume of traffic is a major concern. It has limited green space and a large portion of its green space uh, fronts Concession Street and isn't available for the kids to use because of that. Um, so to achieve this, uh, Queensdale boundary could extend, rather than extending south, it could extend along Fennel to Upper Wentworth and the Armstrong students could attend Queensdale instead because it's already the small school out of all of these proposed school changes. Um, so that would uh, put bump Queensdale up to roughly, um, if my numbers are correct, 515 instead of I guess 300. So um, Linden Park, I believe if uh, the boundary for Queensland wasn't extended south of Fennel, then Linden Park would still have uh, a bigger boundary and my kids don't go there, but I just can't see closing that school would just ruin the community. So hopefully you guys are taking that into consideration. Um, so we already know that renovations are needed to make these changes and accommodate the school closures. I would rather see the funding invested into Franklin Road School instead of GL Armstrong. Much hard work and fundraising initiatives have been put in by the parents of East Mount. This includes smart boards in every room and currently roughly 60 iPads. I would rather see the students of East Mount Park traveling as a group with their technology to Franklin Road. Thanks. Thank you. If you could just hang on one moment before you disappear, we have a couple of questions. Trustee Johnstone. Is Kathy, was it? It's Carrie. Carrie? Carrie, thank you for coming in. Uh, as I believe you're the only parent from East Mount Park. I did have a question. I know that you said that uh, you were obviously representing your own opinion, but I'm wondering if you could also speak to, is this a conversation that's being had in your school community? Do other parents feel the same way or is there other opinions? Um, I have spoke to a couple piece, people at East Mount and obviously everybody's first choice that we want our school to stay open, but I feel like that's not going to happen. Um, and I, the volume of traffic on uh, Concession Street and uh, GL Armstrong has been, parents are not happy with their, their children going to GL Armstrong because of the limited green space and the traffic and that's really all there is to it. It's not that it's a bad school, it's just that it's not ideal. Franklin Road, it seems to be a more ideal location. Does Thank that you. answer your question? Okay. Thank you, and we have a question from Trustee Brennan. Yes, I wonder um, if the presenter, do you, did you send in, a, I didn't see a letter uh, from you with this proposal, and I was trying to take down notes as you were speaking. I'm just wondering, Mr. Chair, if that is a material that she can send to us directly. Oh uh, yeah, I can definitely send that to you. Yeah, because I think um, there's a number of boundary change changes references that yeah. the trustees may want to visualize. Oh yeah, yeah, I have I have it here. Um, I mean, I could show you after, or I could send it to. Before you leave, if we, if you have it, we can just take copies and it can be distributed. Sure. In packages to come in by email. Sure. Yeah, that'd be yep, great. That so just stick great. around for a couple minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your. Thank you. So thank you to all the delegates. Uh, before we move to the information items, we're looking for a motion to receive all the, de the delegations from this evening. I see moved by Trustee Hicks, seconded by Trustee Brennan. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. To, uh, moved by Trustee Orban, seconded by Trustee Hicks. Thank you. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. Thank you, trustees. Uh, before and going into the communication items, which is uh, item number three, we have 16 letters, uh, part of our communications package. Would trustees like to receive them all together? Yes, so moved by Trustee Glauser, seconded by Trustee Orban. Yes. Is, would anyone like to speak to any of the um, correspondence? 
you for information, thank you. All those in favor? That is unanimous, thank you. Uh, this portion of the evening we will move, and maybe I'll ask Dan to come down now while I'm talking. Um, did we move to the trustee arc question? So these are question and answers that trustees have asked in previous meetings or by email, and uh, our facility staff well, is going to present some of those answers. But before we move, facilities. yes, yes. But before we move uh, to that process, we're probably going to take a two or three minute break while Dan sets up. But I do want to just take the brief opportunity to thank everyone, especially our community members, for joining us this evening. This is the last and final of our four arcs and we know the amount of work that it's taken. And, and we heard from uh, Stephanie the amount of trustee time, staff time, pages and whatnot, and we did hear about the volunteers, but beyond that, just looking at the amount of time that our community members have put into this process is absolutely appreciated. This is your time, this is your uh, time that you could be spending at home doing other things, but you're here in our boardroom, and that means a lot to each and every trustee here. So. We just want to say thank you very much for participating. The process is not over, um, so we hope you st uh, stick around and we hope that you attend our future meetings and input is still welcomed uh, right up until the final decision is made. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll take a two minute break, thank you. Sorry, William. Sorry, William.
Okay, we have 20 minutes left before the meeting ends, so if I could have trustees take their seats, please. We're going to get started with Dan's presentation. If everyone could please take their seats. I'll, I'll take this moment to explain a little bit of the process for how we move forward with these questions and answers. Dan is ready with his presentation. He is going to answer questions that have been submitted to trustees. <laughs> Trustee Brennan, can you please take your seat? Thank you. Not for long. Okay, so this part of the process, Dan is going to present the questions that trustees have had from uh, a previous session or submitted by email. Uh, following that, if trustees would like to ask questions of clarification on Dan's presentation, we are welcome to do so. And then finally, any new questions that trustees have, we'll entertain those arc by arc. So Dan, we turn the mic over to you. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the trustee questions, and these uh, came uh, over the course of a number of weeks and we're responding this evening. I don't have any music and I have no presentation, no animation in my slides, so I think we may have to up our ante on how we present these. Um, so first and foremost, West Glanbrook, as we work our way through, there were no uh, questions that came out of the West Glanbrook arc um, from our previous meeting. West Flamborough. A number of questions and again as as always what I will do is refer to the presentation and whenever we can't fit the information on the slide I will refer you to the handouts which are sitting in front of you um, so can you please provide actual ride times for students in the arc as they are today so the first bit of information you have which is a number of tables are every single ride time um, that we have there's five pages worth. Sure. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just want to be ensure everybody has a copy of the Yes, handout. please describe what has been handed out. It's front and back, I believe, when you say five pages. They're single-sided pages. They all, the first page will have the run ID in the top left-hand corner of that Thank you, Dan. Um, so these were on our desks this evening before we got here. So just check the bottom of the pile, as I just did. Dan, you may proceed. Sure. So the, the spreadsheet in the, which everybody has, or the collection of spreadsheets, identifies every bus run for the West uh, Flamborough Arc. Um, one interesting point there is that we conduct almost 
1,200 bus runs per day, of which um, 12 are over 60 minutes. And when I say over 60 minutes, I'm 62 minutes, 63 minutes, and what? Over 60, correct. Second question, why was Queen's Rangers not included in an ARC? When will it be in an ARC process and what cluster will it be in? Um, the secondary associate, it's, it's tied into the secondary school. So the secondary school is Ancaster where the West Flamborough cluster is really Dundas Valley. Um, the accommodation review schedule identifies the 2016-2017 school year as the year in which um, Queen's Rangers will be involved in an ARC and there's the pr proposed grouping of schools that will also be included in that ARC process. Is there any Canadian research available on small versus large schools? What are the definitions of small and large schools? Um, and we'll go point by point through this one. So small schools are generally better for most purposes, but small is a relative term. And you've heard that said at this mic numerous times. Um, in districts where there's 1,250 students, a small school could mean one of 1,500. So it, a small school is relative to the size of the district and the size of the schools within that district. Mandating a particular school size or aim to change current practices is not recommended as the range of optimal school sizes is just imprecise. So we... No. Trustee Turkstra? That's in bullet point number one. So there's a reference, Dan, to 2,500. Is that 2,500 or 20? So th through you, Mr. Chair, districts, if we're talking both south of the border and north of the border, districts can include enrollments and total populations of 2,500. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. So if we could go to the director on yeah, that question. Through you, Mr. Chair, this is actually unfair for Dan to be um, answering this slide as I'm looking at it because it's not an area that facilities usually deals with. Basically what this slide is saying is there are boards that have very, very large schools in Canada. And in those boards, what is called small would be very different than boards that have a small school such as 500. The definition of large and small is very dependent on context. And so when you look at the research, it's very hard to see numbers as being the indicator, but more perception and context that drives it. So where there's boards that have high schools of 2,500, a high school of 1,500 is considered small. In a board that has high schools of 1,100, 600 is considered small. And that becomes the basis for what most of the research is founded on. Thank you for the clarification, Dan. So in terms of construction costs, here we're back on my terms now, in my comfort zone. In terms of construction costs, what are we including in soft costs and where does remediation or soil remediation fall into this? Uh, Sorry, Dan, before you go into your expertise, I just want to ensure that uh, the question was answered for uh, Trustee Hicks. Can we go back to the, the previous slide? I asked this question, <clears throat> but I part of the, the question was, from the ministry standpoint, did we have any information from a ministry standpoint that they were going in the direction of changing the funding formula for rural and urban schools? <clears throat> Excuse me, because I had read that they were trying to maybe come up with a formula to protect a little better the rural schools. So I thank you for the, for the information, but that was part of my question from the from a ministry standpoint. And I think I <clears throat> also asked if the directors had talked about that with the ministry. Thank you through the chair. Thank you, Trustee Hicks. I'll go to the director on that to see, is it an answer we can an ask? Okay, great, Mr. Director. Through you, Mr. Chair, the effective and modernization process that the ministry just undertook engaged this. Right now, the ministry's major concern, as trustees are aware, is percentage of accommodation. Schools over 65% full, schools under 65% full. Through you, Mr. Chair, where there are rural schools defined in ways of how far away other schools are from that particular school, that's when those percentages begin to be adjusted and there is some room that the ministry provides. In terms of changing the definition of rural, it's something that emerged through the consultation, but nothing at this point has been decided upon and the directors of the province have said very clearly that where a school has no other option, 
but to remain open with its present population due to distance, then the ministry must ensure that proper supports are provided. Where there are urban circumstances or even suburban circumstances where schools are close together, that's when the 65 less, 65 percent more in terms of accommodation comes into play. Thank you very much. Dan, if you can proceed. Sure, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we received this question in a number of different formats. It was answered one way in this context here, and there's more to this question later on in the slide deck. Okay, so, so just before, and I'll, I'll allow questions on this particular topic, just because we've already allowed them, but in future questions, if we could hold them, but I'll go to Trustee Orban. My concern is also with uh, rural schools. I thought one of the most significant differences was the fact that it takes a lot of buses in regard to transportation because every child, usually in rural areas, is picked up by the road of wherever they live on the farm or wherever. So therefore, I thought one significant difference was through the chair that this is very significant uh, cost for, to maintain rural small schools. I, I just want to clarify, Trustee Orban, I'm not, I'm not understanding the question. Well, I'm not the question sure if other trustees are. I'm saying are. is that's the major difference in cost maintaining rural schools is the transportation. And also there, those communities are far apart, some of them, and therefore uh, there is a, an awful lot of uh, transportation and the small little, uh, like I taught for a while right. in a one-room school area. And uh, they are, every one of them are picked up. And for a while, even before we amalgamated uh, these, uh, I had visited Glenbrook and there was a family that really you know, take my kids from my farm across the road because of the uh, hazard of safety to the school. So that's where I'm coming from. I thought that was a major significant difference for the ministry to ensure, especially in northern areas, as well. Thank you, Mr. Dirk. Yeah, let's, let's see. Through you, Mr. Chair, the ministry takes that into account with the, the way in which they support rural transportation. Thank you very much. So, so we're going to proceed with the presentation. I just want to remind trustees, we do have just 10 minutes left, and then we'll need a motion to extend. So if we could let Dan uh, finish the presentation, hold your questions for clarification. Um, we'll answer them one at a time. And then following that, where we're going to try to squeeze in new questions that trustees may have. So if you can go through the presentation. Thanks, Dan. Sure. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, construction costs and what are included in soft costs and where does uh, soil and site remediation fall into that? Soft costs are actually the costs associated with architects, engineers, all the studies that we conduct for a school site. Um, remediation is factored into the benchmark costs. So for example, if we were putting an addition onto a school or demolishing part of a wing, the funding that we receive from the ministry would incorporate not only the new addition, but the demolition and uh, remediation of that site. In other cases, the total construction costs would also, sub a submission to the Ministry of Education would be made uh, with regards to uh, remediation as part of our business case plan. Why is staff recommending a rebuild on Spencer Valley and not Greensville? This uh, came up to us last week, so there's a number of reasons here. One is the site size eight acres versus five acres. It provides greater flexibility for a number of reasons. One, we're constructing a 525 or the proposed 525 people play school on the site. So you have a larger footprint of a school, a larger site allows you to uh, accommodate that in all of the outdoor programmable space. We also, um, if we're constructing new and keeping the old school operational, the more space you have on a site allows you to do that without the two sites um, conflicting with one another, for lack of a better term. And as I mentioned, it provides more opportunity for outdoor sports uh, fields and whatnot. And again, uh, the point there, and that's directly out of the, the report, should new funding not be available and renovate, renovations become the direction, then there's less um, deferred capital maintenance required at Spencer Valley over the course of the next 10 years. So transportation services provided a letter to parents indicating ride times in exceeding 60 minutes. And I think this was the question and the tomato um, from two weeks ago. So uh, in response to that and some questions, um, just to provide some context on how this actually happens, um, letters are actually sent to parents in August prior to 
a bus run actually happening. And it identifies an initial bus run based on an estimate that's derived from a computer model uh, software. As part of the planning process, once we actually start school, we start understanding how long these bus rides are, they are monitored, they are adjusted to fall back within board parameters um, whenever possible. And as you can see, with specific reference to Route 6125, it was checked in October, and the route actually, and this is the route that was referenced in the letter, leaves Spencer Valley at 245 and completes its route by 340. Just to provide some context, because I believe there was some mention made to a 75-minute bus ride um, during that presentation. So renewal needs at Millbrook Public School in the first five years are high in urgent needs. When was it last audited by staff? And is it based on the life cycle or real costs? So it was actually last validated by staff uh, in 2013. And the validation process is done on two fronts. One, the ministry, uh, it's ministry software that we use. Their engineers come out and assess it. The starting point is always, what is the life cycle of the particular element that we're looking at, the boiler. So an estimated life cycle of a boiler may be 25 years, and then as they go into the individual schools and understand the work that was conducted there, that life cycle is adjusted and incorporated into the what was the, um, the recap database, which we're all familiar with. So we heard a lot about 100% EQAO results at Millgrove. What accounts for these results? And through you, Mr. Chair, that's a call to pass off to me. <laughs> so basically what trustees see on this slide is that though it's very hard to be absolutely precise around what might cause a change to an EQAO score, all of what you see up there is the culture of a school, the engagement in the school, and the instruction that's provided in that school. And so clearly what you see on this slide is some examples that speak to the team approach, uh, the parent and community engagement as partners supporting the learning in the school and that clearly where the culture exists in a certain way uh, in all of our schools where we have really achieved this kind of culture we do see this kind of improvement. So the next two slides I will make reference to a handout that everybody has in front of them. The answers are quite lengthy. I don't know if everybody wants me to read the entire paragraph. But what I will suggest is that both slide 13 and 14 are addressed on the same handout. They include the question as well as the response to uh, the specific questions. And just to be clear, the questions include the child care center at Millgrove, how does it work with FTK, and the out of catchment policy with regards to that particular school. West Flamborough ARC recommended a 45 minute limit for bus trips, what happened to that idea. A 45 minute bus trip was considered and brought forth um, by the ARC and is part of the ARC report. Um, the idea was brought to trustees attention during the delegation night. We also brought up follow up information to trustees two weeks ago that um, outlined what the additional cost to provide that or to cut that bus ride down to 45 minutes. So this is built, this information is a follow-up to information that the board has previously received. It would include more runs, dedicated runs, and additional costs to the board to drop that bus uh, time down to 45 minutes. Is there a distance, distance limit to our transportation policy? The simple answer is there's no distance limit. It's a time limit driven policy. Are there any other ways to redraw the catchment areas to optimize school populations in this arc. Um, we've explored numerous options to try to best uh, redraw these boundaries and we believe that the presentation or the proposal by staff best utilizes the schools with the uh, options and catchment areas that we have created. Taking into consideration those points. So, West Flamborough, what is the population growth in this area? A number of people made observations about the area in reviving over the course of the next 10 years. Um, enrollment projections, I will quick, and this, there's supplemental information in the handout as well, is that there is growth in this area. It is defined and um, 
really co contained within the Water Down community. There is significant growth. It'll be ca it's captured in our current education development charge background study. It will be identified in our new one. Um, there are sites to identify this growth, and it's really contained within the Water Down um, community. So, Dan, sorry, just a just a note. We have about three or four minutes remaining. Um, is is that enough for your presentation? <laughs> Almost. I'll go as quickly as I can. All right. Can staff please revise scenario number two to address the latest top-up funding announcement and adjustment to the boundaries? And everybody has that in their handout. Central Mountain, there were no questions on Central Mountain. So general accommodation review questions. General accommodation review questions. Should we have to do renovations? Um, what are kind of the guidelines and benchmarks that we build to? So June, new gymnasiums versus renovations to a gymnasium to build to ministry benchmarks. So if we're building a brand new gym versus expanding an existing gym, those are the estimates that we use. If we're building a brand new FDK classroom versus renovating an existing FDK classroom, those are the benchmarks that we use. And these are just benchmark costs. They all still have to be tendered and the costs may vary and then an additional classroom you can see identified there as well. How do our projections and what do we use, um, what formula or matrix do we use given the fact that ARCs uh, started seven or eight months ago? So this goes back to our enrollment projections and the information that we use. As I mentioned before, the planning department updates their, annual, their projections on an annual basis to ensure that they capture the most recent um, in, uh, development information, census information, um, home closings, the projections are basically split up into two components, the existing community in a, in, a, in a certain given area, so the existing community are people that currently reside in there, and how those people and students move through our system from grade to grade, and then we overlay that with projections for a new development, and new development is based on housing forecasts provided by the city, yields are attached to those housing forecasts, and they are overlaid. So there's two components to our enrollment projections, which are important because new development grows, grows at a different rate than existing communities grow. So we ensure that we capture those annually, they're updated annually, they're monitored annually, and, and they are uh, part of our long-term facilities master plan update on an annual basis. So the second part to our uh, urban versus rural schools. Is there any information from the ministry in terms of defining urban and rural schools in terms of funding guidelines that provide new directions on closures? So I will leave the points there for everyone to take a look at. And the source here is the Ministry of Education. I will also point out, just as a reminder to everybody, that it, this information will be posted on the website along with all the handouts. So while we are going quickly here, the information will be available. So how are other neighboring school boards managing rural schools? We are all faced with the same challenges and that's a quick, um, a quick survey of our neighboring school boards. How do we handle rural schools? So and that in three minutes is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I very rarely get applause up here, so I'm gonna take it in while I, while I have that opportunity. Must be that podium everyone is <laughs> getting recognized. Okay, so we are at 10 o'clock. Um, this is the time when the meeting technically ends. Would trustees like to um, extend to ask questions or would we entertain a motion to adjourn? Do trustees have any questions that they would like to ask? I see yes, so that would require a motion to extend. Is there a motion to extend? Moved by Trustee Bishop, is there a seconder? Trustee Turkstra? A 15 minute extension, seconded by Trustee Turkstra. All, all in favor? That's Trustees Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Maholland. That's unanimous, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation, Dan, and we'll jump right into questions. So the first, if we can first get questions for clarification to Dan's presentation, and if you could just reference the question as well. I'll go to Trustee Bishop first, and then I have Trustee Turksra on my list. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions in reference to the oh, Okay, does any trustees have any questions for clarification of what we've just received? I have Trustee Turkstra and then Trustee Brennan.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just looking at some of the bus times, and I guess I'm most concerned about, um, well, all of the secondary bus times to Parkside and Highland. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but they're all over 60 minutes. So through you, why? Thank you. See, that's direct. I like that. Dan. <laughs> through you, Mr. Chair, that's the shuttle service between the two schools. Thank you. What does, that, what does that mean? What does that mean, Dan? <laughs> that means that's the, the, the time it takes that they're going back and forth between the two to pick up at one, pick up at the other. It's not the same. Sorry, just to get the clarification, we'll look just to the director briefly. Mr. Director. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, there is a shuttle that goes back and forth, but this amount of times, I'd like to ask if you would, because she did all the homework, if our manager of corporate communications could actually clarify what that means. Thank you, manager. Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I, I would have to take this back to Kent for, for absolute clarification, but I believe it's because these buses are going from Highland to Parkside, um, and doing a loop before they go, before they actually do their route, that's the additional time that makes them go over that, um, that length of time. Because they're going to both sites. Well, they've all, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, they've always done that. So this is, this is something new. Not, that is not something new. Yes. And all of the bus rides are over 60 minutes. Let's get, let, let's get clarification, sorry, just not, not, not cross dialogue here. If we Through you, Mr. Director. Chair, we, we do know that the policy is clear that it states to endeavor. We understand that it's the board's will that endeavor means make it so. We will take it back to Kent to find out if we've been erring more on the side of endeavor, which is what their policy reads, but to figure out exactly what the circumstances are. Thank you for the clarification, so we'll see an answer back at the next opportunity. Um, anything further, Trustee Turkstra? Um, uh, yeah, any questions of clarification? No. no? Um, I haven't had the chance to read it. Ah, so. and we'll, but we'll have, just to remind trustees, we have until Wednesday at four o'clock to submit any questions to Heather, if anything comes to mind, or new questions for that matter after the meeting. Trustee Brennan? Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I just kind of need a yes or a no, so I apologize, Mr. Chair. When I asked the original question about soft costs um, and remediation and th that sort of thing, I guess if we have a, a certain amount of money, let's say $32 million for a new high school, does all of that, does 32 million cover all the soft costs as well as the construction? That, I, I just wanted a yes or no on that. Thank you, Dan. Adam? Sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. Oh, good, thank you. Anything further, Trustee Brennan? No, thank you. There you go. Okay, any further questions for clarification on the presentation? The none, I, I have a really quick question, and that's just regarding the East Hamilton chart. At the bottom, when it uh, refers to the totals, um, and we look at, say, for instance, 2022, it has a utilization at 58%. Is that based on all seven schools still? Because I'm doing the math, it looks like it's all seven. I just want to see if that was assuming all seven are open versus the reconfiguration to five. Through Mr. Chair, as opposed to standing up, I will get back to you on that one. Okay, Bye. yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so we're looking for new questions at this point and I have Trustee Bishop and I, Trustee Turkster, were you on the list for a new question as well? Thank you, so we have Trustee Bishop followed by Turkstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have general and I have specific to a particular um, how do you want me to proceed? Can I, or do you just want me to rush through the questions? We're gonna, let's just go one question at a time. Um, as we know, staff aren't gonna answer directly. These are new questions. So if you can just read through your list of questions, right. um, we're gonna, because of the time constraint, right. Right. and then uh, we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. Right, Councillor, councillors have been drawing to our attention that um, land, that the city does not have money for land purchases. We have been paying park levies um, um, for at least, um, since amalgamation at least, 
So my question is, how much have we paid in park levies since amalgamation, which of course, Mr. Chairman, are meant to be for paying for new green space for the city? I'd just like to remind everyone that um, we have to pay park levies even though our space is used, our green space is used. So. Thank you. So, Charles, staff have that question. Next question. My next question is on page 11.35 of the staff report of the East, of, of the Central Mountain Review, the cap, the, there's the following sentence. The capital needs of each school that will be remaining open to ensure proper student accommodation and best use of our funding um, will be looked at uh, or something to that effect. This is in the staff report. So um, in previous recommendations, there had been an upgrade to a gym at Franklin Road, and I'm wondering whether there are other upgrades that are not costed out that we may need to do to those K-8 to schools. So I'm, I'm asking about what are the capital needs of each school that will be remaining open. Thank you. To, like make them, to make them, Mr. Chairman, we're not interested as trustees in creating have-not schools. Sure. Thank you. Heather, Heather appears to, I think you, do you have that, Heather? Okay, we have the question. Next Thank new you. question. My next question is, um, uh, is um, th these are, uh, this, is, this is historical data. We had some interesting historical data sent to us. But I'm wondering, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, when was Rosedale first suggested for closure? I believe it was around 2000. And I would just, I would just like to know that, please. And similarly, um, in um, Woodward and Linden Park were also put in board planning documents for recommendations for arts. And I'd like to know those dates, please, Be prior to these dates. Thank you. Thank you. And then I have a fir my final question, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure, so we, Heather, we have that so far? Yes, final question. My final question is, um, how important, we heard very strongly from Greensville and Spencer Valley that they want a new school. We heard that very, very strongly, the, the importance of the new school. So I, I, my question is, how important to getting that new school for Greensville and Spencer Valley are the, the addition of the Milgrove school, school numbers? The, the, in, in, in other words, the closure of Milgrove. And this, just to clarify, is that for the business case? Yes, for the business case. For the business case, yes. okay. I just want to know that, I want to be sure that whether I know, I know this fact, please, okay. about the business case, whether, how important Milgrave is to the business case of Greensville and Spencer Valley. Thank you. Okay, that's Trustee Bishop's questions. I have one more trustee on the list. Two trustees on the list. New questions, Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the first one I have is um, uh, on tonight's video that we got from Ms. Danko. And she made some comments about flexibility for 21st century learning in a JK to eight school. Uh, basically, with the use of technology, I guess, that we would have less of a need for subject specialists. Uh, at the middle school level. So I'm hoping that staff will provide a comment on that. 21st century learning with uh, subject specialists for our intermediate students. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is um, at the city board relations meeting on Thursday, I was hoping that um, we would look at Need for traffic studies and crossing guards and whatnot when it when it pertains to some of the transportation changes from walkable to uh, busing uh, students or for them taking HSR. So what are though what is the relationship that we're going to have with the city on crossing guards and traffic studies with our the impending decisions we're going to make? Because okay. it was it was allured to tonight that there are some serious intersections uh, that need to be looked at should we make a certain type of decision. And, and are you looking for financial or more of a... I'm looking for how we're going to work together on that uh, based on the recommendations that are coming forth 
knowing that some of these intersections will need uh, either traffic studies and or crossing guards. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the other uh, question I wanted to ask is um, relates to partnerships. And that is, uh, we, you know, we didn't get any partnership, um, any viable partnership uh, requests back or interest back, or I think we actually got some interest. But then I think because of the criteria that we have and uh, the challenges that we have and the cost sharing implications of those facility partnerships, that none of them have actually come to fruition. So my question to staff is, what are the criteria, challenges, cost sharing implications, conditions and agencies that we're trying to pursue? I know we got the list, but what are the barriers that are preventing the people who have shown interest to drop their case? Is it cost? Is it liability? Is it because when you're sharing a site with school children, uh, there are some serious implications. Thank you. Uh, the other question I had is, I wouldn't mind getting access or a copy of the People for Education Ontario Small Schools Report, because that would seem relevant to us in Ontario. Thank you. And uh, I think the last one I had is uh, we, we talk about extracurriculars at our elementary schools. And I know that we have more robust extracurriculars at uh, uh, the intermediate level, grades six, seven, and eight. So can you <coughs> tell us how many of our elementary schools that are JK to five actually have extracurriculars? I think it's more of a middle school Okay, and Middle that pertains to all arts? In general, in general, do we have a lot of extracurriculars and what are they in the K at our J K to five schools? Okay. Thank you. And I'm looking at my chicken scratch. If I have any more, I'll have to send them on Wednesday. Wonderful. Okay, we have uh, two minutes remaining. We have Trustee Brennan. Okay. And Trustee Hicks on the list. So Clarification from the director. Mr. Chair, I don't know if it's appropriate if there's a question that's not under review. I, what, what, what I, given the time constraint right now, we'll just regroup after the meeting and um, whether it's via email and clarify a verbal question that may not have been clear. Okay. Trustee Brennan? Oh, okay, Trustee Brennan will submit by email. Trustee Hicks. One minute remaining. I can assure the trustee that we will bring her uh, interest on transportation to the city board relationship on Thursday. Thank you for the comment. And with the final 30 seconds remaining, Trustee Bishop. Mr. Chairman, I see I have an, uh, a question I overlooked. Um, we heard from the Woodward School about the, 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 the crossing over, level crossing and, and other roads um, going down Woodward Avenue to get to Hillcrest. And I'm wondering, um, uh, would those fit? Would that fit us? Safe, there's a safety I aspect in our transportation policy. Would would their concerns be met through that, Mr. Chairman? Okay. So the transportation plan from Woodward to Hillcrest. Yes. Thank you, Trustee Bishop. Seeing no further questions, with three seconds remaining, Trustee Turkstra. <laughs> I'm running out of seconds here. Okay. Trustee so Turkstra. Here it is. Uh, there, there's been a lot of talk from a lot of people about changing the funding formula at, at the provincial level, and that's the big problem that we have. My question is, we've been trying to do, to, we've been advocating for a change for the special ed, just the portion of the funding formula, which is a huge algorithm, just the special education portion for years, for the eight years I've been here, we've been asking for it and it hasn't happened. So I want to know realistically, if people are going forward with, if, if a funding formula change is what people are looking for, it will be a long-term solution. So what I wanna know from the ministry's point of view, right now, whether you're, whatever political party you belong to, how can you possibly change 
the funding formula in a short period of time to solve our problem. Okay, we'll leave that with staff on yearly budgets and changes. <laughs> Thank you, and Trustee Brennan, that's a motion to adjourn. I don't think we need a motion because we're beyond our time. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you for the questions and we will see you soon.